so Bill, how did you get into comics originally? When did you originally get into comics as a kid? Ah, well, on this on this uh, website we have, uh, people are always asking everybody, uh, everybody should should say, you know, what is the first comic you read? So I've actually been thinking about that. The first real comics I think I read were uh, uh, Superman comics because I was going through that period where the, there were only Superman comics and Batman comics, uh, and they don't ever all the other comics had faded away under the influence of the evil Doctor Wortham, and uh, so I think probably I was born in '49, so. Uh, 53, 54, something like that. And it seems to me like there were all these Superman stories where he's, if he, uh, if he tries to interfere with history, it goes bad. And uh, he, he's thrown back or something. Uh, but they, they weren't terribly interesting comics, Jim, because you, you, you immediately understand the pattern. And... Uh, and then, you know, there are the ones where, where we see it, it was a dinosaur one where, where Lois and Jimmy and I think Perry White all got thrown back into the Jurassic period. And so Clark is having to, uh, to somehow figure out a way of, of saving everybody from dinosaurs without uh, giving away his secret identity. Uh, there were an awful lot of secret identity stories. I, I only learned later that kids would write in to uh, uh, write in and say, you know, we lo I love super gorillas. Can you write a story about a super gorilla? And so they would do it. And uh, what if what if Lois was old and Superman was a baby? Uh, wouldn't that be cool? And so they would write all these really bizarre stories so that was that was the, well, those are the first stories but the ones that really influenced me to write comics were when harvey came out with the uh with the uh spirit the two spirit stories and just before that i was i was uh i was i was reading a uh uh i, I read uh in, in playboy a uh uh, an article by Jules Pfeiffer about reminiscing about being in the spirit in the Eisner studio. And he was, uh, and he was saying that uh, it was, it was like si seeing real, real, real uh, bone hitting real flesh when, when uh, the spirit would hit people. And, and it was, it was real. It was a, it was a strong, story and sight so and 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 his uh and and you know the brush strokes were were as were as real as the as the characters that they were they were portraying that kind of thing and so i said oh i'd love to read this and you know like two months later i was in the back of a bait shop uh dreading the fact that i was going to have to go fishing with my father and uncle and uh in the back, they had a uh, those uh, Harvey reprints, and uh, so I actually bought it right off the stand, uh, just like it was 1952. And, and then I took it home and was studying on it. And at the time, I was just I was either used to using pencils or or pens, uh, and I had picked up the. Uh, the, the art supply store I was working in, somebody was a salesman for Collinor. And so we had all these uh, uh, technical fountain pens. And so I was, I was using those. And he said, but, you know, do you want to use a, a weighted line or a deadline? And I had no idea what any of that meant, but I knew that the pens were free. And so I, I, I said, well, those... Well, those I would want to use, and and so I'd been using those, but of course it was a very dead line, and uh, although you can finesse that if you if you if that's all you use for several months, uh, 
you could actually find a way to make the line be weighted. But I was, uh, oh, I know, I, I was uh, some, some one of my friends who was a, a slightly more experienced art supply seller than I was, uh, suggested that I, why don't I go home and play with the, uh, with like a watercolor brush and see if I could do anything with that. And, and I did it and I said, oh my God, that's what, that's, that's what a comic book line is like. It's, uh, you know, the weighted line. And, and so all of that kind of all blends together as to how I got started seriously doing this. But of course, I still, I still had not the slightest clue about how you actually got into comics. And I was, you know, I, I just, because uh, uh, I knew you, I, I knew that people went to New York to do it, but that's like saying you go to Venus to do it. <laughs> You're living in, living in uh, Royal, Royal Oak, Michigan. So in uh, 1977, you started doing your first real professional work that I'm aware of for uh, Power Comics, right? Yes, yes. This is where I start doing my hard teasing uh, because uh, professional. Hmm. Well, we were all the little group of, of of us that were in in you know sort of sort of into into comic books, and one of the things you would say is, "Oh yeah, we're you know that looks pro." That's, that's a pro thing you're doing there. And I thought, you know, this is really giving the only two comic book companies that exist a lot more power than they should really have. Uh, because by that time, I realized that one of the things was that uh, you, could, you could actually do comics with a bunch of different things. I had been ca uh, catastrophically went to law school for six weeks. And while I was there, since I had no friends and no desire to be there and no way of even talking to the professors, I, I, I went to a, uh, uh, they, they still had head shops there. And one of the other Playboy uh, articles that I had read said that there were underground comics and head shops. And by God, there were. That all dried up in about three years, but. So I picked up a bunch of those, and of course, those were all done with technical fountain pens, most of, most of them. Uh, so that was like the second big influence that I had was, was, was underground comics. And I would, try to, I would try to emulate them and try to follow them. And of course, at some point in there, I then started seeing the very early work of Richard Corbin, and, uh, who I only knew as Gore. Uh, which was his pen name. And just shortly after that, I started signing my work, Mara, uh, who was a, a champion of the French Revolution and a publisher who published from the sewers so that he wouldn't get caught. And he ended up uh, catching a skin disease from being in the sewers all the time. Uh, that's the reason that he had to take soothing baths. And that's the reason that when you see that famous David a uh, painting of him being star or uh, stabbed to death by that woman whose name I should remember. Uh, but anyway, he was he was being starved to, uh, stabbed to death in this in this tub, and that was the reason. So I always thought that would be a cool name to have. It would be Mara. That's super interesting, man. I've seen a little bit of your work. I was looking back through, and uh, I think it was uh, Justice Machine where I was looking at a lot of that stuff. D did you learn a lot from that period? I think that was from what, about 1977 to about 81 when you were working on that stuff with like power. I know there's a couple of things like Justice Machine you've come back to and worked on for quite a while. Yeah. And actually, we were only at that, that studio for that summer. Oh, really? Like, yeah. I, I was tapped. Uh, I, I, had, I had done some, uh, some drawings with a uh, with actual uh, map frames on them, uh, which was very high tech for me, and I uh, I took a let me see how this worked. Yes, my this fellow actually hired me 
to do uh, to do a comic book for him, and I did it in the worst possible way. And uh, I wanted to do comics in the worst possible way, and I, I really did. But he paid me enough that my friends and I were then able to go up and uh, go to Maine for a year, um, part of a back to the land kind of thing. And I lost track of him, but when I got back. He had set up this studio in uh, East Lansing, Michigan. And so that was where I met other cartoonists. And I've always I, I always heard, and Will Eisner used to tell people that you should actually go into a studio with other people and and you should learn from them. And that was true. Uh, I had uh, my friend Joe Zabel was there. He was actually the one that taught me how to do all those neat Richard Corbin effects that I had, had so admired. And then Mike Gustavich was there, and he was he uh, was doing very mainstream kind of inking and, and, and art. And then uh, Bruce Bennett, who is still uh, is a now a professional uh, uh, actor, and he is uh, but he also did uh, really really great political cartoons for for various East Lansing ma ma magazines after this was all over. And we all sort of learned from each other. And we all brought out the books that we loved and, and read them over that summer. And that was also the summer of Star Wars. All the theaters that had blind bid on, on Star Wars got to keep it for as long as, as people would come to see it, which meant it was here for four years. And they all were able to buy Dolby sound systems and it all had, had, had new seats by the time that was over. Uh, there were just, there would be endless lines in front of all, and, and one of those little theaters was right down the street from where we were. So we would, we would uh, be sitting around in the middle of summer and we would say, oh, what do you want to do? Do you want to eat something? No, no. You, you want to do art? No. No, we hate doing art. Now that we're being paid to do it, we hate it. Uh, no, uh, why don't we go down to see Star Wars again? So I saw Star Wars probably 90 times during that, during that summer because all these theaters were also very poor. So they, they, it was only like, you know, three or four dollars, which is about what we were being paid at the time. We got, we got paid a hundred dollars a month and room and board. And they, they, what they wanted us to do, they, they thought that, you know, Mike would teach us all how to do regular mainstream comics, and then we would be inkers or something, and he would train us to do that. And he did. He, he did it to the best of his ability. But we were all so young, and we really didn't have the ability to do anything that we couldn't do. And so, you know, the, our two bosses kept telling us, you know, well, you know, you have to do this, and you have to do that. And... But that was when I discovered the great secret, which is if you're not being paid anything, you can't, you can't actually be forced to do things. And Fair we enough. were, you know, we were doing our best. I mean, that was, that was when I learned, uh, I, I learned an enormous amount of stuff there. I learned how to use a, a light box. I learned how to, how to, how to do a, uh, do waxing, not to lose hair, but, but to, but to, to wax word balloons onto, onto projects. I was gonna say, you're kind of a jack of all trades. For anybody who's watching this, who's not familiar with going through comic credits quite like I am, because I'm a little bit obsessed with that. You've done basically everything. I mean, you did lettering and inking and a lot of those processes that you've used are kind of, uh, they've gone the way of the dinosaur now with, with digital technology, but some of the stuff that you learned to do was incredibly impressive and and for any and i don't really want to harp on it or or uh, talk about it too much because i just don't find it to be like a big marking factor on your career but for anybody who hasn't noticed you were i think seven when you lost your arm and you did all of this one armed and and, and a lot of this requires an extreme amount of precision holding a page in one place. So I was always very curious of exactly where you'd honed those skills to such a razor's edge. Because you say that you had trouble learning, but I mean, I always found your work to be fairly impressive from a very young age. 
Okay, well, well, one thing was, uh, I, w- I was, uh, I was actually 13 days old when I oh. lost my arm. I had a, uh, a tumor the size of a man's fist on my on my arm, and so they said, "Well, let's take that off." And so they did. Uh, they also told my mom, uh, "Well, you should take him home and love him because you're going to be so upset when he dies in two years." Wow. And which is explains to me why I, I have a really good feeling about going to doctor's offices because everybody was always so glad to see me. And I did, you know, like my, my dad uh, worked for Chrysler, so he had car company insurance. And so I always could get prosthetic arms and, and all the latest things. But even the latest uh, things in 1955 we're not really very late. And I, uh, when I was, I think, in fifth grade, I got my first artificial arm, which meant that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go out and play with kids or anything. They were terrified that I would hurt them because you have this big hunk of plastic over here and, and the, it's way over here and up around. And then you have two different uh, Velcro Actually, the first one wasn't Velcro. It was actually a, it was a buckle, if I remember right. But you had to get get so you had to get the thing so tight because in order to make it work, you had to like expand your chest, and then that brings the arm up, and then you make a move sort of like this because of the the thing on your belt, and that and that makes. Uh, makes it lock into place and then your uh, hook opens and closes like this and if you're running through the halls as you always had to do because you only had two minutes to change classes you suddenly can't get a breath because this thing is so tight around your chest and you've got you've got an undershirt on then you have your prosthetic with plastic that breathes, which is a little like military intelligence. And then, uh, and then you, in order to be able to not see all the, all the bumps and screws and everything on this, then you have to have another t-shirt out of the top of it. And then you put on your, and then maybe you put your, uh, your shirt on. So in summer, you actually start to get a little blurry because this is so hot. And, uh, and, you know, it didn't matter that you would go back to the, the place that installs the prosthetic arm and say, this is really hot. And they would say, oh, no, it isn't. It's plastic that breathes. But I, but there were, I actually got two things. I got a, uh, I got a regular articulated arm. And then I got uh, just uh, something that fills out your coat. And I loved that. I loved putting that on, among other things, because it had a secret compartment in it that nobody knew about. In order to keep these things from being unspeakably heavy, they had to be hollow. And so you could sort of reach under here, under where the armpit would be, and you could drop things in there like pencils and pens and candy and you lost your arm at such a young age did you do you ever feel like that was a big hindrance or do you like was it easier for your other artists uh that you were working in the studio with when you guys were learning how to do everything because like i know lettering you you know rapidographs and using like zipatone and that kind of stuff i just imagine like stabilizing the paper had to been a pretty big kind of a learning curve to get used to well but you learn learn that sort of thing pretty quickly. Um, you have a, uh, for example, uh, there's something called plastic tech, which you put up posters with. So you can use that to stick the pencil the paper down with. And it doesn't, I had an interesting conversation. I, the first, the real, real first professional that I ever met, like a professional who actually could make a living at it as opposed to the rest of us who are calling ourselves professionals. Uh, this was Joe Rubenstein. And I'd actually heard his name, you know, I mean, 
And he sort of adopted me at this Texas convention that we were at. And I, I helped drive him uh, to get his glasses fixed. And so we had a, like a whole thing. And he, yeah, I remember he took, he, uh, we had like uh, EC he comics, uh, like collection, those big thick collections of EC comics, and he would he would go through with my wife and me and 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 point out what made this comic great and what made that comic great, and it was it was just really interesting to even if you don't agree with it, you know this is this is a professional, and he had brought a whole bunch of his stuff with him at the convention to to ink, and and this happened to be when Spider Man had gotten his new costume. And he, he told me that he said, well, this is, this is very, this is, this is was very good. I, I, I was so thrilled when I found out it would be an all black Spider-Man because I wouldn't have to do any work. There, there wouldn't be any hatching. There wouldn't be any, uh, I wouldn't have to do any webbing. It's just black. And he said, that is the hardest thing in the world to do, to try to do an all black Spider-Man in an all black alley against an all black sky. He said, that's, that's where you really learn, earn your money. He was very, very kind to me. We, they, they were still sending people out to do uh, for Marvel and DC editors. And I said, uh, and I said to Joe, uh, oh, you know, I'd love to go up there and, 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 and talk to that guy. Uh, you know, I can't do that. Look, there's a this huge line here. And, you know, he says, well, just walk in front of them. I, I was not yet used to native New Yorkers. Uh, <laughs> he said, what are they going to do? <laughs> I said, well, I can't do that. And he grabbed me by my sleeve and pulled me through the line, knocking everybody over. And he said, Real artist coming through. Real artist coming through. <laughs> oh. oh, that's great. So when would that have been? The mid-80s? Like 85, 84, 85, right around then? That was when Spider-Man was getting his new costume, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I would have been... I think I was doing... I had done Journey for for two years, maybe, at that so. Yeah, I was going to say, because that was, what, 1981 or so that you hooked up with uh, Dave Sim and uh, Aardvark Vanheim and stuff? How did, Can you talk a little bit about um, how you met Dave? For me, Dave has become a tragically misunderstood character in comic book history. When people talk about the black and white boom, they instantaneously conjure up Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, which is all fine and well, but for me, it's Cerebus number one. And Dave's personality, I think, has kind of unfortunately gotten a little bit in the way of his legacy for comics because he's not an important figure in comics. He's an indispensable figure in comic books. And I'm very curious because you met Dave at a very pivotal point in his career. So I was curious how you got hooked up with him. There's a totally different story that I will tell you as soon as I remember any of the names in it. It's uh, they 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 asked uh, they asked a, uh, one of the one of the great uh, composers of, of popular music. They said, "What is uh, Irving Berlin's place in American popular music?" And he said, "Irving Berlin doesn't have a place in their, in American popular music. Irving Berlin is American popular music." And I think of Dave Sim as being that, uh, and his personality doesn't just get in the way a little bit. It gets in the way an awful lot, actually. Um, my wife and I were actually in Cerebus a couple of times uh, because he didn't agree with us. He was at the point of saying goodbye to us in our Dark Vanaheim and he used to denounce us from the stage, you know, but that didn't keep me from, you know, I always voted for Dave in the uh, CBC polls where they would say, you know, who's the, who's the best letterer, who's the best inker. It was always Dave and, and Ger Gerhardt. You know, it doesn't matter if you're pissed at him at the time. 
Uh, and the weird thing was, I met Dave and Denny at a uh, at a convention. Uh, there was a fellow named uh, Bill Paul who was putting on uh, conventions, and it was a it was a very '70s kind of convention because he had an old house, and he would invite a whole bunch of people there, and then we would all cook and cl and clean. Uh, so it was a, it was like a commune sort of too, and uh, and and Dave and Denny were there, and because uh, it was during that period of Cerebus where you know, I must admit, I at that point I was a little, I was a little uh, off put by by Cerebus only because I had created a character called the Bunny of Death. And it really didn't look at all like like Cerebus or like an aardvark, you know. But I was so jealous of the fact that he had a, a real comic book with a bunny-like character in it. But then, you know, I got to actually see what he was doing and and during this period. Well, and I was buying Cerebus every, uh, you know, every month. And so Denny mentioned that she was looking for... Uh, for, for backup features, or I don't even know if she mentioned that much about it, but, you know, send something into us. And so I did. Uh, I was just about good enough at that point to be able to do that. This, was, this, this would have been actually before, before Journey. Uh, and uh, so I, I sent it into her, and she explained that what she was trying to do was to do these eight-page stories so that they could bump up to the uh, the page count of Cerebus without actually increasing the work that Dave had to do. Something I can really appreciate now. And uh, so another, you know, why don't you do some eight-page stories? Well, of course, Eisner did eight-page stories. So this was like a really, really... Uh, Part of my wheelhouse. I just, I just love this, and and I, so we agreed I'd do two issues, because that's what he was doing is uh, inviting everybody to do these these two issue uh, plot arcs, and so I so I so I did the first one, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I really enjoyed this. I can, and this was Welcome to Heaven, Doctor Franklin. And I said, you know what? There are things I could do with this. This is really great. It's too bad I can't, you know, I can't do more of these. And the phone rang. And it was Denny, and she said, uh, you know, I can't find anybody to do the third one. Would you mind doing three of these instead of two? And I said, why, yes, I believe I could do that. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm finishing up the second one, and and, and thinking about the third one and and of course the third one actually had to have an ending to it the, the others didn't have to have an ending and i said you know this is going to be great this boy it would be great if i could do a fourth one you know and and the phone rang and it was denny and she said i can't find anybody yet would you mind and so i ended up doing six of them all together and denny said eventually that you know they got more comment on mine than they did on all the other, all the other backup strips put together, and uh, which would actually make sense because I did, you know, I did had got a chance to do a much longer story than anybody else too. But that was because of the fan mail that was I was pulling in, and because of the fact that I was able to do this on a, on a sort of semi regular basis. I, uh, uh, she asked me if I would be willing to do my own book, and that was, and that was how Journey got started. So, for anybody who's not familiar, um, Journey is your longest running project. It's been going since I think like 1980, what 83, 84, on and off, and uh, it's on and off. Yeah, mo a lot of times off, uh, but uh, yes. Can you talk a little bit about where Journey originally came from? Where did the idea come from? Well, a lot of the things happened when I was in college. Uh, a lot of these ideas happened. The Bunny of Death, 
uh, I had like I had like four characters that I that I worked on, and whenever I got a new paper or a new pencil or uh, a new ink pen or something, I would do a uh, I would do a version of uh, of one of these characters. Uh, so I did many drawings. I I just I just discovered, in fact, in an old issue of Power Comics, an old drawing I did of Wolverine McAllister, which I've been trying to talk Mike into putting into uh, Yeet, as a matter of fact. Uh, but I was I originally had this idea of I I I, I was a big fan of uh, of Trash Man, agent of the Sixth International. Uh, which is one of the characters that I, I read about in, uh, in, in the undergrounds. It was done by Spain Rodriguez, who I actually got to meet eventually. And uh, I even met S. Clay Wilson. And uh, it, was so, it was so cool and it was so, but it was so bizarre that they were not actually either real revolutionaries or real sex perverts or real or real serial killers, uh, you know. They were they were other artists uh, who were who were trying to score, uh, doing uh, doing mainstream work, uh, you know, illustration work in in slick magazines or something, you know, just like the rest of us. Will Eisner was he actually the only person I ever met who was exactly the way he should have been. He was, uh, you know, and. Uh, he made the mistake the first time we met of saying, you know, we should keep in touch, which I'm sure he actually said to everybody and in that very kind way. But I called him on all the uh, all the Jewish holidays because, A, there were a lot of Jewish holidays, but there weren't so many that I was going to be calling him every other day. And eventually I actually got to be in the Eisner studio in a weird way. He He asked me. He was he he was doing a bunch of comic books for the hardcover European market, so he was doing something called uh, the Real Lion King about the uh, about the origin the legendary founder of Mali, the, the kingdom of Mali, and mm -hmm. uh, and he what he had done is he had a, a series of a very small drawings of. Uh, of the, of the pages that he had just roughed out in typing paper. And so he, he said, can you just Lucy these up for me? I don't know if you know what a Lucy is. We don't really need them anymore. I'm sure if you want to explain what they are, I'm sure a lot of our viewers won't know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, uh, it's essentially a, uh, uh, an opaque projector that you project up on a screen so that you can make a drawing any size you want. They're about five or six hundred, five or six thousand dollars to get a good one, and I'm sure Will not only had one, he probably had a spare too. But uh, I didn't have one, so what I did was I, uh, and there are ways you can do it using graph paper and that sort of thing to expand things out. But no, no, I was not going to do that. Instead, what I did was I just went to a Kinko's and just. Uh, expanded it out, uh, you know, on, on bigger paper. Uh, and then I, so then I had an expanded drawing and then I would put, use one of their big uh, uh, opaque projectors and just trace it off. Not a, not an elegant clue, but, but one that worked. If you, if you want to be in Will Eisner's studio, yes, you're going to do that. And so, so I, so I did those, and then Will, who believed that I was so much better at research, he said he wanted to have me draw all the animals. And and because uh, he used to have people that would draw animals and the animals in the spirit. And of course, that's what you do when you hit, when you when you get a uh, an assistant uh, is they draw all the animals and they uh, and he said then you know do the research on what the actual. Uh, huts look like and that kind of thing and if you could find out what the real colors are so i did that i because I, I was a history major so i i did kind of know how to do research that was 
one of the things, you know, I, I did a fair amount of research on Journey. And so my original idea with, with knowing, I, I wanted to do a character like Trash Man, uh, a revolutionary character. And I said, well, why don't we make him a, uh, why don't I make him Frontiersman instead of, instead of the sort of slick spy-like character that Trash Man was? But I will, I will do him as a, uh, a really advanced frontiersman. So I've given him a repeating flintlock rifle and all this. And so I got, I got as far as sort of plotting out some of the stories uh, tie it with uh, fighting time traveling, uh, uh, time traveling doctors who are vivisectionists. But all the, all the advanced weaponry that I was giving him. I, I gave him a laser boy knife, too, as I recall. But he was, uh, but you know, it, it, it wasn't actually very interesting for him to have all these extra weaponry. Uh, I think that's the reason that James Bond always has his break halfway through the, the first act. Uh, because it's much more interesting to, to have somebody who has to really fight to to do this stuff. And so by the time I got done with my time traveling vivisectionist story, uh, Wolverine McAllister was back in, uh, was actually back in, uh, in 1830, which was when the real, uh, when the, when, when the real frontiersmen were, were going. And in the, in the 19, in the 1830s, you know, in California, that was, and I had actually stumbled across a book called Give My Heart to the Hawks, which is a story of the original uh, fur trappers and, uh, and frontiersmen. But, I, but I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know, it would be more fun to have it be and not be in California because that's going to be an awful lot of research. If I could find a way of setting it in Michigan, then... You know, then then it would be uh, I would at least be more or less sure if I if I drew a tree. Well, that's the kind of tree that grows in Michigan, you know, and all the weeds and stuff that I was that I was drawing to disguise the fact that I couldn't draw feet very well. And it turned out, actually, that I was uh, uh, I was I was painting. I was going to a club that painted little lead fi gaming figures. Uh, I've never had trouble doing things really, really small uh, to answer one of your earlier questions. Uh, and so we were, we would meet down at the uh, Wayne State. Uh, this is not true. It wasn't at Wayne State. It was at the, uh, at the fort. Fort, uh, well, that's gone. Anyway, that, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's a, it's a fort down down on, on the Detroit River, and uh, and they have like an exhibit of things like like real flintlocks and real Bowie knives and, and a lot of Indian exhibits, including what real uh, and real moccasins, because we have a tendency when we draw moccasins to make them look like shoes. So I'm aware that Mar that Wolverine actually does use real real uh, moccasins. Um, that are stitched along the top. So I, that's where I found out about all that stuff. Of course, now you can just Google it. Uh, and, and of course, the reason that he's called Wolverine McAllister is not because of John Burns' Wolverine, at least not directly. Because when I was reading comics, I was reading comics back, I was reading comics, the X-Men, back when Wolverine made his first appearance. I guess it's second appearance, because his first appearance was in some other book, but if you walk down any street in Michigan, you'll see Wolverine Shoe Store, you know, all these different stores that are main, named Wolverine, and so people later on would say, you know, well, why did you, why did you steal, you, you wanted to call him Wolverine because he was so popular, right? And they, no, because he wasn't popular when I knew him, he was just one of the guys, it was just like the Badger or a bunch of other characters. He was, we knew who he was. We all thought he was going to die. 
because he kept using his claws on people. And we knew that eventually Marvel's uh, morality squad were going to have to kill him off. It turned out that all the people that he was killing were all robots. <laughs> yeah, I remember finding that out. I was like, how did they get away with that Hellfire Club issue? It's, oh, oh, I, I see. They're all, they're all robots. Well, well played, Marvel. Yeah. So that was around uh, like 83 that uh, you met somebody that I'm going to grill you about. Uh, can you talk about meeting Sam Keith for the first time? Okie doke. I had done the uh, third issue of Journey, I think. That now, I come from that era of comic book conventions where the creators could be a little rough. I really, really rough on the fans because we know now that they weren't even allowed to keep their own artwork. And they were being, they were basically treated like children. And, uh, they didn't, they didn't like that. The only place that they, they got their full due was, was when they were on com comic book fans, which meant that they kind of misbehaved a little bit. Everybody misbehaved a little differently. I know we used to say, you know, if, if only the creators and the comic book fans were all gay, then they could really, they could really accomplish something. But, but none of them were. So the best, the next best thing was to get drunk with your favorite, uh, with your favorite hero, and people have picked up on that uh, from uh, science fiction conventions, where everybody desperately wanted to get drunk with their hero. But I got to see my friends and my heroes when they were all drunk at those comic, at those science fiction conventions, and it, it really put me off drinking. Uh, you just, it, there's just nothing like, like seeing Ray Harryhausen weaving down the hall at a, uh, at a comic, at a, at a science fiction convention and, uh, and not even able to stand up straight. I convince you that really, really, you don't want to have that second beer. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit here, but. Well, when I was with, hanging out with Joe Rubenstein, uh, he said a really nice thing to me. And he said, uh, we were, he, he was inking some of my stuff and I was inking some of his stuff. And he said, you know, I think the reason that you have this really clear, clear inking style is because you, 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 you have to ink without having the other hand to, to move the page like this so it, so all your work is so straightforward and I, and I said is that is that a nice way Joel of saying that I have a uh, that my inking style is so is so simple that you can barely stand it and he said he said you're assuming that you have a worse inking style than I do wow and I went off and got drunk ah uh, cuz <laughs> imagine I mean, when Joe Rubenstein inks things, it's, it's, it's like he's inked them uh, in neon. You know, it's just, it's just so beautiful. And so that was a really nice thing for him to say to me. You know, I've always, I've always wanted to have a time when I could, I could actually turn to somebody and say, you know, I have as good an inking style as Joe Rubenstein. But somehow or other, I just, no, 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 that's not really true. But anyway, so that's that, that's another thing that happened at that comic uh, that Texas convention. But now we'll go back to what you wanted to talk about, which was uh, oh Sam Keith. Yes, uh, so I had I had just done like I had, I had first three issues of Journey, and I brought a, a you know you get like fifteen copies or something, hopefully. So I saw that there was a uh, there was going to be a chalk talk by Harvey Kurtzman. Now, even at this point, uh, the uh, San Diego convention was too was too large. We uh, because you could go to the whatever the, the main convention was back then. Uh, did I say oh, this was at the San Diego convention? Well, it was, and we drove 
through the uh, through road from Texas, we over the uh, Rocky Mountains or some part of the Rocky Mountains. I mostly remember the terror of that. The guy that was doing it was uh, uh, was driving us, and we had two vans, and uh, we had uh, Bill Willingham was there and uh, Mike Gustavich and all those guys from Texas Comics uh, were there, and my wife, and my wife was there too, and. And the guy that was driving us uh, was uh, was completely high all the time he was doing it. That's how he calmed down from having to drive through the Rocky Mountain. So I remember that. I remember terror, but I don't remember exactly how we how we got there. But anyway, I was so I was there, and I saw that we were having this uh, uh, this chalk talk. Well, what they would, did was they spread the convention out all over San Diego. And I, so I finally found out about uh, 20 minutes into the, the Chalk Talk that uh, Harvey was, was doing this, this uh, appearance at this little motel. And I got there, and there were three blocks of people waiting to get into this little tiny motel. And so we're all, all of us who were at the back of the line were sort of in shock. We didn't quite know what to do. Where, you know, you didn't really just want to turn around and leave. It was obvious that nobody was going to be able to get in. Nobody else was going to be able to get in. Uh, but, you know, you had to do something. And, and so I ta started talking to these two kids who were there. Uh, one of them, it turned out, was Sam Key. And so he, he, you know, we were talking about things. And, and, I, and I had always said, that if I was ever in a position to be a pro at a comic book convention, that I would treat fans better than I had seen them being treated. So I, I made a big effort to, to talk to these kids and explain what I was doing. And they were very imp incredibly impressed, much more impressed than they should have been, uh, that I had three comic books out. And, uh, and so I signed, uh, you know, I, I used their backs to sign the comic book to them. And it was, uh, and we're having a moment. And then uh, this nice young lady comes and, uh, and says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assisting uh, Harvey with his, with his chalk talk. Um, you can see that there's three blocks worth of people. And, and, and there's like one little room that Harvey is in. I'm, I'm pretty sure a couple of people might cancel, but I'm pretty sure that, that you're not going to get to see him today. And so we, did, we decided we go and I, I went in to buy, I bought them a, uh, or started to buy them a Coke because um, we couldn't get drunk together. And, uh, but he, but, uh, as I'm talking, Bill Willingham comes up to me and he says, Bill, can I talk to you for a minute? He says, I think I've just broken into Marvel. And so we're kind of congratulating him and so forth. And I turn around and the kids are gone. Oh, shit. So I, I treated them exactly the way all these, all these asshole professionals have treated people through the years. And they're going to just remember how horrible I am. So next year, weirdly enough, I was back in California because Dave had decided to put on Petunia Con. And, uh, and this kid comes up to me and he says, you may not remember me, but my name is Sam. And I was, uh, I was one of these two kids you were talking to at the line of Harvey Kurtzman. I said, oh, yeah, let me buy you a Coke. Uh, no, I said, but, but I said, you know, this is, uh, this is great. He said, well, you know, I studied that book that you gave me so that I would be able to uh, come close to being able to imitate your style. And he showed me this work that he had done. He did a, uh, he did like a house ad, double page house ad for Journey. And he did a... Uh, a huge, uh, he did several other things and he did like, uh, I don't know, six or seven page uh, 
detective story of an old, an old woman who was a private detective long before a murder she wrote. And, uh, and she was, uh, and, and, and so I said, you know, this is a, uh, this is great stuff. And he says, no, it isn't. And I said, yes, it is, Sam. It is, no, it isn't. So I took him around and uh, introduced him to people. And uh, he, through that, eventually, uh, he got to be the inker on Mage. And that was because of your suggestion. You're the one who kind of made that connect for him, right? It, it, yeah. Yeah. Although eventually, he, he also was the one who called me up. Because we talked every week. He called me up and said, can you write other people's characters? And I said, I don't know. Uh, and he said, well... He says, I know that they are looking for a, a writer on Johnny Quest. Did you ever see Johnny Quest? And the answer to that would have been so depressing to him that I never told him. Uh, but I was, I, I was not a big Johnny Quest fan. It's because it's everybody else who saw Johnny Quest and who loved it was 12. I was 17. And so all the ads that said, this is, this is uh, Johnny Quest is the most realistic animation and the, and the greatest uh, storylines that were ever produced for comics. And I was a very literal kind of 17-year-old uh, anyway and very censorious. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to like this. And plus I remembered watching the old Popeyes and the old uh, uh, Warner Brothers cartoons where they had like real shadows and, and everything, you know. What, what Johnny Quest had, which I didn't appreciate at the time, was Doug Wildey doing, doing the breakdowns, doing the, the storytelling, which is brilliant. But it, certainly it was very limited animation and... Uh, and so I wasn't able to appreciate that at all. But this was a job. This was an actual job that looked like it would pay actual money, which Journey really wasn't at the time. I had gone and, uh, and I, I talked to Julie Schwartz at, at DC, trying to get a, a job there as well. And, uh, and Julie Schwartz was really underwhelmed by, by Journey and my talents in general. You think we want to, want to have Superman drawn like this? And, and, and he said, you know, this is, uh, I had had a friend who, who did like a one page cartoon in one of the issues of Journey and, and he was, uh, and, and Julie liked that better. Uh, you know, maybe this guy could work for us. Uh, but uh, he says, you should get into our new talent showcase and see if we could, we could, do something with you there. So we brought it out the we brought out the editor for New Talent Showcase, and he and I did that sort of dance, freelancer editor dance. With, what would you like me to draw for? Draw for you? Well, what would you like me? What would you like to do? No, no. What would you like me to do? And and so, and so, and then finally, I said, you know, well, what are the rates? And Julie said, the rates. The rates? What do you mean the rates? All you young people, all you, money is all you care about. You don't care about the art. Because I've been working at that point for practically for free, trying to break into comics for like 10 years. It was really depressing. And, and so anyway, we made some sort of agreement that I would call up and see if I could get something into New Talent Showcase, which I never did. And I just sort of struggled out and tried not to throw myself in, into New York traffic. And, and I, uh, but I remembered, uh, because actually, because uh, Joe Rubenstein had said, well, Eisner was going to be at uh, the Arts, Art Students League, uh, where he always taught. He taught every other week. So he could smell New York again, I think. Uh, and uh, then they were, all the rest of the guys were supposed to show up because we're going to take the whole class away from him. So I, I showed up, and he, he had, you know, we, we talked briefly at a couple of conventions, and 
So he, he recognized me and he made the, can you wait a minute while I finish up this half of the class and gesture and I did. And, uh, and then he introduced me to everybody and he said, so Bill, how's it going? And I just, at that point, I just fell apart. I just pulled in my whole tale of woe all the way up to you young people today uh, don't, don't care about the art. All you care about is money. And Will said, Julie, 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 50 years and you're still full of shit. <laughs> Which was so what I wanted, what I needed to hear at that point. And, he, and then we talked about my stuff and, and he showed me, they pa passed around the, uh, the issues of journey that I had with me at the time. And, and he said, and I, so I don't know where he got that hat. He said, but, uh, but I really don't know where he got that inking style from. Whereas, of course, he knew exactly where I'd gotten that inking style from. I'd stolen it from him. So that was me trying to make money. And so I, I finally actually started to make a living when I was writing Johnny Quest. And uh, those were all stories that I had told myself before I went to sleep, actually. In, in different, you know, they didn't have Johnny Quest or Race Band or any of that in it but just the basic kernel of them. And so most of those I was going to, I was going to at one point try to write as a science fiction script and, and or a story and, and try to freelance that way. And so instead I did this, I did the, uh, I, I, I imported most of those into, into Johnny Quest one way or another. But after a while, when you're using the same characters over and over again, you can also come up with other things. Uh, I, had, I had just finished reading Daughter of Time, which was a story about how, how badly uh, Richard III was portrayed in, in history and in life. And so I actually put that into a Johnny Quest story, which made Diana Schutz laugh, I think. Do you actually think that any of our readers have ever heard of Richard III? So, like, during this period, you and Sam, you said you were talking, like, every week at this point? Pretty much. He would, well, Sam is a little insecure about his, his own work. <laughs> you are very polite, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, so he would, yeah, he would call up. It's ironic, of course, because... No, I, I just like everyone else, I can't get in contact with him either. Uh, but uh, he is, uh, if, I had a, if I had a secretary or a real office or anything, I think I would, I would not talk to anybody on the phone either. Uh, I made a choice. I would just you know, never, have to, never have to block a phone call ever again. Uh, but, but he was... Uh, but no, he would call up and he would say, well, you know, I'm first it was, I'm just always going to be doing these, these stupid isms uh, for, for the Kamiko animal book. And, uh, and I'm never going to be able to do anything seriously. And then, and then he would say, you know, and then he would say, well, you know, I'm only going to be able to do inking now. Everybody's going to just say I'm an inker, right? I'm never going to be able to do be a penciler, and and then and then uh, and then I when he when I he I, I got to do it got him to do penciling, it, you know all anybody's ever going to see me doing is 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 fourth century BC philosophers, and then he finally got to uh, got to do uh, uh, Dream Master, uh, Dream Sandman, Sandman. There we go. Uh, yeah, uh, and. It, and he would actually have made an enormous amount of money off of that if he had, hadn't felt insecure about his own artwork and dropped out at issue eight or nine instead of issue 10. Uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, so we would, we would talk about whatever Sam's latest insecurities were. So he was always that self-effacing because I've talked to several other people. I... I'm obsessed with Sam and I'm for a little bit of background. So I don't sound completely like a raving lunatic. 
I'm extremely dyslexic and dysgraphic. And when I was growing up, that was not something that was diagnosed. Uh, the, the learning disabilities were just, they, they weren't talked about. And I couldn't read forever. And he did a filler issue on The Incredible Hulk, Incredible Hulk 368. I got that issue and his art struck me so much that I literally, I remember sitting and for months I worked at it and I figured out finally how to make everything stop moving on the page and figure out what they were saying because I loved his art so much. And right after that was when the Max came out. When the Max came out on the back of, actually the card's right here, but it came out in Wizard and on the back of it, it says the Max is dyslexic. He's the world's first dyslexic superhero. And something just felt like the universe was like speaking to me. And I keyed in on him. And I've been trying to track down stuff about his career for, oh God, 15 years now. But I've spent the last, the better part of the last three and a half years doing some serious research on what is now becoming a basically a full length, multi-part documentary on Sam and his career. And I've talked to several people that came up with him at the convention circuits and stuff. And they said that his, his personality was quite a bit more outspoken, but that he was always just super rough on himself about his artwork. Was, is that kind of your experience with him? Oh, yeah. Why um, do you think that is? I have no... Well, he, he takes everything so seriously. I mean, he... Uh, he was he was sat saying that and by the way I'm I am not dyslexic but I grew up with a stutter and that's partially the reason we have these long pauses when I'm when I'm talking anyway he, he uh, yeah he he just would he would say you know that because we we were all fans or and and in fact I was an employee occasionally of of the comics journal and. So he took everything that was said in the comics journal just absolutely super seriously and much more seriously than it deserved, frankly. Uh, I, I, I stayed with them for like a month at uh, Fantagraphics Castle and uh, we, we argued about just about everything and they were perfectly willing to listen to me, but people think they aren't. And they also think that they aren't, that, that, you know, they're like these incredibly intelligent people, and they are incredibly intelligent. But just like everybody else, you know, they have their own opinions. I mean, I, I, I was going to be a history, or I was a history major, and so you know, you know, everybody has their own opinion, and they're, somebody was teasing him about us once that, we had we had planned out this uh, this thing where we, where we were going to have this this uh, a glow in the dark cover, and Sam had always said, "Oh, one of the things I want to have is a like glow in the dark cover, because that's what every comic has. And I want my comic to be just like everybody else's comic." And well, his comic is never going to be like everybody else's comic, but uh, <laughs> he. But we did that, and because we did that, you could, you could, you know, uh, you would get one of those one of the dark covers if you bought a uh, a crate of other of, of regular comics. And what we didn't realize was that everybody was so crazed at being collectors at that point that people would actually buy were buying enough maxes in order to get a whole box of the glow in the dark covers and we didn't know that we didn't know we, we could not figure out why we were selling more comics than any other comic in the country which we were and he said well you know i was talking to the fanographics people and they were saying that we planned that that we would deliberately did it in order to uh, do it and they said that is the most crack marine thing I ever heard of. And so the next time I was on the phone with them, I said, did you say that? Because you know, we just blundered into that. And they said, well, Sam didn't deny it. And he said, of course he didn't deny it. You said it. He thinks that you know best, as opposed to me, who knows you never know best.
Gary always laughs when I say that. Have you? Have you? Did you ever read the uh, a little thing that? Well, we actually put it in one of the issues of Yeet uh, that uh, Mike Gold wrote about my my satirizing the comics journal in an issue of Journey. Uh, well, I had done it. There was a, it was a really really terrible article that they had they had written and. Uh, all about how it was better to uh, how how it was more sincere to, to uh, rather than having things actually printed that they should all it was much better than when we used to have everything done by by hand and I that is, that is the insanest thing I ever read and it's and it's and it's being said in the comics journal over about twenty five pages of big words and uh so i so i had i so i did i i, I satirized that issue of journey and and he said and so mike gold said you know that is the bravest thing i ever heard, ever saw anyone ever write because it's i was being published by fantagraphics at the time and and i said he said no actually gary is not like people think he is I mean, yeah, he'll, you know, he likes to argue and, and, and he likes to fight and God knows he likes to fight. Uh, he likes to fight with my friends. Uh, but like he wanted to have a, a like Denny had a, a publisher's letter in the front of each issue of Journey. So he was going to have his publisher's letter in the issue of Journey. And I said, no, you're not going to do that. Because you're going to insult all of my friends, and it's going to look like I agree with you. If you're doing it in my magazine, you're not going to do that. And he said, "Oh, okay, that's fair." Gary and is such a character. He is. He's a. He's a. But he's a wonderful character, you know. And and he and I just really get on. It's uh, you. You just you, you know, you have to call him on stuff, you know. I remember when we were at one of the San Diego conventions and they brought him up and they actually gave him an ink pot award for his publishing. And he, uh, and he managed to, to not insult them because that's his impulse. But afterwards he said, I, I say horrible things about them in every issue of the, of the journal. And I said, yeah, but sometimes you're right. And they, and they, and they understand that it's, and sometimes you're right. And besides, look at all the all the people that got published that wouldn't have been published because of you. They know that. But you know, he just he was so sure that that all they wanted to do was to destroy him. And uh, and that's the side of J Gary Groff nobody knows. You know. Yeah, I've never heard that. I I'm very much into the comics journal because of their interviews. I think they're historically kind of indispensable. A lot of their, as you said, I mean, I, I just think a lot of what they wrote is, a lot of it's crackpot at, at certain points. You're just like this, is this just like some wild hair you got up your ass at 2 a.m. when you were stoned or drunk before you went to sleep and it just started grinding your gears while you were asleep and then you woke up and decided to write a 30 page article about it? Cause it's and like I really got into that with the uh, American flag because I did a retrospective retrospective look on on American flag when I started digging into like why is it that people don't talk about American flag what is it that turned everyone off was it that it wasn't from you know Marvel and DC was it characterizations of women was it Howard Chaykin's personality and like as soon as I hit on Howard's personality that's when I started reading all these interviews with Gary. And him and Gary, you know, I mean, I'm sure you know, but they go back to high school and they would go at it like, like just, just slapping fists. That first, that first interview he published with Howard Shaken, like he, he, he went to proofread it and he called up Howard and he's like, we're doing an addendum because I, I refuse to not print your interview, but you just slammed all the comics journals so much and Howard wouldn't back down. And that's one of the best interviews I've ever read. I love it. But the comics journal is just, it's so skewed at points. I, I can't, I can see something like that really crawling under Sam's skin being as neurotic as he was. 
and and I can see it kind of rolling off of yours as as laid back as you appear to be. That's really <laughs> interesting to hear. <laughs> well, yeah. So I I once asked Gary because he he asked me all the all the all the characters that I like. Yeah, I could usually roll off a bunch of novels and, and things, and he would know about them. For example, I really loved Gore Vidal when he would do his uh, his articles. Gary would say, yeah, but, uh, you know, he's not opinionated enough. I don't know. He's actually started several wars. I, I, think, I, th I think he managed to be opinionated enough, but... Uh, but, but so then they said, well, what, what, what are your favorite writers? And he ran off a whole bunch of writers that I'd never heard, even heard of. And I realized that after a while that they were all like from the Cahiers de Cinema. The, they, they were all yeah, critics. They, they, they weren't any creators in there. And that's, you know, that's what, what Gary loves is, is, is criticism. That's interesting. Very interesting. That gives me a brand new perspective on Groth. I, I'm a big fan of his writing and, and, you know, like I said, his historical research and, and stuff. But I've, I've always had a very hard time reconciling that with this. I don't even It seems like he's just putting on like a cartoon character a lot of times when he's when he's acting out. You can't hear the tone that Gary uses when he says things. And it's this, you know, the the guy who's the who's in charge of the second biggest fraternity in, on on uh, campus. You know, he's just you know he's he's saying it. He, not, not that he doesn't exactly believe it, but but that he's saying it because he it also is going to be funny when he says it and have and, some sort of impact. Yeah, and sometimes taint funny, maybe. There was a there was a party we were at, and I had this big. We were well, we were in California. I had a big pool here, and and Gary, because he was so competitive with every every other writer, and so there was a writer there who I'm not going to mention, and and somehow Gary had gotten uh, she had gotten on his bad side somehow, not can't I remember, it. Uh, but. Another another female writer and and Gary was pretty competitive with female writers as well. But he was he 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 decided it would be funny to throw her into the pool. And it's one of those things that we we all see when we, we watch old Walt Disney movies. You know, everybody gets thrown into the pool. And as he's doing it, I have this thing in my head where I'm. I'm seeing him not throw her quite far enough. And she was also like, I think she was like, he, he was maybe five foot nine, five foot 10, something like that. And she's like five foot maybe. And she's actually pushing him towards the pool and she's really not into doing this. And I'm, I'm thinking all kinds of things. I'm thinking, you know, she's probably, she doesn't want, I, you know, unlike, unlike guys, girls have clothes that can't get wet. You know, that's, that's one of those things, you know, they just get ruined. Plus, she's struggling enough. What if she hits her head on the side of a pool? I mean, there's just all kinds of things that Gary is simply not thinking about at this time. He's just completely focused on the, how funny this is going to be. And I reached out and I gave him the uh, Vulcan death punch pinch. And uh, I've got a pretty strong hand. And he went right to his knees. <laughs> and he said, Bill, what the fuck? You know, what, what, what are you thinking? And when I made sure that she was, she was, uh, she had made her escape, I said, you know, this is not cool. This is not cool, Gary. There may have been some alcohol involved. I'm I'm almost the only person I know who hardly ever gets drunk. Uh, my my father really hated the idea of people getting drunk, and I also had relatives who would go to, go to like Christmas parties, and they would end up really sloppy drunk, and uh, they were just 
and it just it just seemed awful. Uh, so I never I never got into the hang of it. And I also because I moved around a lot from Ferdale to to uh, to Huntsville, Alabama, to to New Orleans, and and so I never really got into a real crew where you where you have all those guys that grew up with you and you all learn how to drink together and you all learn how to smoke together and. Uh, my my mother always sort of regretted that, even even realizing that learning how to drink and smoke is really something that's kept me alive all these years. But but still, it's uh, it's a, it, I, w- I would always have things where you, you would you would actually be at a party and I would see everyone drifting away from me because they were all getting drunk and I wasn't. I finally discovered like cream drinks, and so I was able when when Marvel would would host that uh, the open bar parties at, at San Diego, I would uh, I would have like one one white Russian or something like that. Uh, but I really I really didn't have any interest in it, and I, I still don't. I'm, I I do I do worse just just. Uh, God knows what I would say if, if I was actually drunk too. Uh, that's interesting that you that because uh, that sounds a lot like that it played very heavily in your career. Like you're very level headed and you have this kind of self aware approach, but you don't get your feelings hurt when someone says something critical. You you seem like you're much more able to dissect it and look for like what is the actual grain of truth there that I can take away perhaps that this person didn't like about my stuff that I can work on for myself. That seems like, it really seems like you must have made like a perfect other side to this Sam Keith coin. Cause he seems (laughs) so, well, he's so self-effacing and like, it's, it's interesting because there's some stuff that you guys have said that lines up dead perfect. Like I spent 10 years trying to break into the industry and this was frustrating and that was frustrating a lot of like direct, very direct correlations, but then it's the exact polar opposites on a lot of stuff. Like, well, who cares what the hell Gary Groth said? I mean, he was putting out one of my books anyway, so I just told him to go shove it. And Sam's over in the corner like, he said what? Oh, <laughs> God, was he make, did, he, did he say something about the feet? Did he make fun of the feet? And speaking of Groth and kind of uh, critical responses that I don't necessarily agree with, Epicurus came out uh, in the 80s through Piranha Press, and that was the first thing that you and Sam really collaborated on uh, that I'm aware of. That is one of not only the the most well-written books I've ever read, but visually that book is absolutely insane to look at. Uh, Sam was in the process. He had, he was that whole thing with Sandman was was like blowing up on him at that point where he was having all the problems with Karen and, and Karen Berger yeah. and, and not getting along with uh, Neil necessarily with Neil siding with her and then giving him Dave covers and him having to redraw that whole first issue. And he just left Manhunter. What was it like working with Sam on Epicurus? Well, for one thing, it was really good for me. It was really good for me. Let me say that. Uh, and yes, he was insecure, and yes, he was worried about things. But he came up with all kinds of things. Like, like uh, I had just a couple of years before, I had been in college uh, in a in a college philosophy course, and so I just loathed Plato and Aristotle and all those guys. I I, I found them irritating, as you can tell, and and Socrates, you know. Uh, and, and that Epicurus was sort of my revenge on those guys, uh, which is of course psychotic because it was it was a revenge held off by three thousand years. Uh, but still, I did it. But Sam pointed out at one point, well, you know, uh, I really want to have Plato. I had, I had come up with a really funny thing really mean, funny thing to do to Plato. And, and, and I was telling him about it over the phone, and he said, well, he said, I really want to be nice to Plato. I, I said, he, he, was, uh, he was one of the ones that was really, one of the philosophers that was really good about, about women. 
So, so I don't want to be too hard on him. Can he be, he be the nice guy? And I said, sure. I mean, my God, uh, why not? Uh, you're doing these beautiful drawings. You want to have a say. But I, but I, but I do find Aristotle really an overrated. I mean, his, uh, his whole idea of, uh, you know, well, frogs are green and grass is green. So they must be related somehow. Really? Really? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure not. Uh, I'm sure that, that frogs are a lot more trainable than, than grass. Uh, but anyway, that was, uh, I'm, I'm going back remembering the actual question that you asked, which was, uh, uh, how did we get along doing that? And I, I thought we got along very well. Now, you have to keep in mind that my, the editor, the guy that had actually come up with Corona Press and recruited me at a convention to do this, you know, and I, so I, I suggested Sam, which I, which I think is, was still a really, really good idea. Not to mention the fact he would be, if, if he was actually doing a comic book, I thought he'd be a lot less panicked when he would make the weekly call to me. And he was telling me all the problems he were having with, with Sam and how neurotic about this and neurotic about that. And, and, and I said, well, yeah, but, you know, look at the beautiful work that he's turning out. And he said, well, yeah, he's a genius, but, you know, there are a lot of geniuses that can't make a living. And, and, and I was tempted to say, well, there's a lot of publishers who can't really make a living either. So, you know, you could be a little easier on people. This was not the first time this guy had, had given me the, the uh, you can be a genius, but you can't make a living speech about somebody or other. So, but of course, everybody in comics is pretty insecure because we're all, you know, none, none, you know, I used to say that, uh, you know, the politics of, of comics is just like the politics of movies. We tear each other apart, but, but you know, we, 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 we do it for no money. You know, it's a lot easier to be ruthlessly criticized if you have your own uh, castle in Spain. And, and in fact, Will kind of said that in The, uh, in the Dreamer that uh, all the publishers were, had all dreamed about being publishers, you know, instead of selling shoes somewhere. So, you know, we're all pretty insecure, and that's the reason we, we tend to slash back at one another. So, as far as uh, Epicurus goes, there was the two parts that came out, and those were part of the original deal that you guys had signed with Piranha, right? It, it was, right. like, basically a two-part deal? Mm-hmm. And then you guys, uh, you did do a third story that came out uh, some years later, correct? Because the, the, there was the 2003 trade paperback collection, and I know that had a new cover, and I think it had a, another story, a third story, correct? Well, it, it actually had four stories, because it had, there was going to be a, a Piranha Press uh, uh, anthology book that had short stories in it. Okay. So we each did a short story. And that, that's the reason that story is in black and white, because all those stories were in black and white. So was that done at around the same time period, or was that done later? That was done uh, at the, about the same time as the first two stories. And then the, the, uh, the fourth book was done as a gesture of friendship uh, by, by Sam. Uh, I had gone through one of those periods where I'd simply fallen into a pit, and I had no money and no way of making any money. And so DC said that they would do a third issue of, of uh, Epicurus if Sam would draw it. Well, Sam is, was not a big fan of drawing at the time. He was having all kinds of trouble with his hands. But, but he came back because he's my friend and agreed to do it. So when we talk about how neurotic Sam is, you know, that's the other side of it that he's also a great guy. That's another thing that I would like to point out to anybody watching or listening to this interview. I know that I kind of key in on negative aspects or what people think of as negative aspects of Sam's personality, but that is only to try to dig further and expose this truly incredible human being that I keep hearing about, but that I find heaped underneath his own neuroses and historical inaccuracies. It, it's really sad. So 
that's let's just let's get into the max let's let i i really i would love to pick your your brain about the max um you you talked about sam's uh view on women um and i don't like to harp on this fact uh because i think sam somehow believes it plays into his career much more than it does um it with his wife and their age difference is is that in your opinion one of the big reasons that he has the view of women and discusses women so much or is his relationship with his wife perhaps symptomatic of that already pre-existing disposition towards older stronger powerful women because i saw Neither. feminism pop up a lot in the max well it, it pops up a lot his uh both his wife and his uh and his mother were very powerful uh and persuasive uh california feminists and so all of that that whole camille paglia movement of feminism and that whole thing was all true and and you know so he was being also i think given a lot of articles about feminism and so forth but i don't think it's i don't think it's so much a psychological thing is it if you have if you're surrounded by people who have strong beliefs then you're going to be interested in mirroring those beliefs in one way or another uh, or discussing those beliefs and of course it's incredibly interesting because you've got this very very sexy and sexily drawn i'm not bad i'm just drawn that way character in the middle of these in the middle of these stories who's also this uh, radical feminist and doesn't even recognize in a way that you know she's using that her sexuality is influencing the way the story works and here's another here's another interesting thing before i forget about it uh, uh you know sarah the the teenage girl have you heard this story where, where sam sam came to me and he said you know we're going to have this this story and i don't remember if it's the second or third issue of of the max where this girl is going to come in and and she's wandering around and she's looking for a father figure and and uh and then and she has this gun and then at the very end of the book she's going to put the gun to her head and the last panel will be blank will be black and i said well, that's that's very interesting, Sam. Uh, that's a that's a very interesting story. I'll be really interested to read it. Uh, and he said, "Read it." No, you're going to be writing it. And I said, "Well, actually, no, I'm not. Uh, that's that's not going to be the story that I write." And that was the only time I actually pulled pulled rank on him. Have you ever heard of um, the, the German philosopher Goethe? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, Goethe, the first story that he wrote, the one that made his career, was one called The Sorrows of Young Werther, where young Werther agonizes over this lost love of his and eventually kills himself on the last page of the story. And then young, young teenagers all over Europe were killing themselves. And I said, now I don't think that we would actually have that kind of influence, but I can't risk it. And, and he said, well, but I just, I talked to all the English, all the English writers that we've been getting, you know, writing for, D, for DC and, and for Marvel. And they all said, you know, what you do is you create a really Im important, interesting and charismatic character, and then you kill them. And I said, yeah, but we aren't going to do that. We are absolutely not going to do that. And besides, I hate all those guys. I, you know, I, well, they're, they're all, I mean, even Alan Moore started out as a, as a horror writer. You know, it's, it's, it's not, they're not really adventure writers. 
games. And, and I'm more of an adventure writer than I am a horror writer, even though that's where I started out, too. I was a big Lovecraft fan. But, you know, his, his stuff is actually a little more adventure-oriented than it is a horror, straight horror thing. So, anyway, that was... This actually took over about an hour and a half on the phone, where he kept saying, uh, so, but, you know, then she'll just, uh, but, you know, it's important that she kill herself. And I would say, well, yes, and it's important that I not write it. And he said, but nobody else will write it. And I said, you're the only one that can write it. And I said, well, that's true. That's why I'm not writing it. And I felt, I, I thought, you know, I realized at the end, after, after I had left the book and Sam was writing it on his own, Sarah actually became a hero, heroine of the book. So uh, I thought that was kind of a moral victory in a way. She became the whole focal point of that second phase of the book because right around when you left the 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 book right around uh you know the, the 25 or so and she became absolutely central to all the stories that sam was telling because he's talked about how he just kind of started repeating the cycle from the first like 15 to 18 issues and then just got bored of that and started telling stories with sarah and she's the one that really kicked open the door and i'm gonna tell you i was a teenager growing up and uh watching that cartoon on mtv reading that issue of the max and growing up as a depressed kid that was one of the best written and most impactful stories that spoke to me during that period of my life the the idea that her playing with the gun that that decision that discussion she's having in her head you did an absolutely masterful job with that. So it is an, it's really interesting to hear the, the kind of the genesis of that. I had no idea. Can we talk a little bit about what the writing process was like on the Max? Because <laughs> well, I know, I know that's a very kind of a silly thing to say from what I understand, but you were working on uh, stuff for DC at the time, big profile stuff. You were doing your, your run on The Flash, which for anybody who has not read it, you can pause this right now, go <laughs> and buy it, and then thank me in six months when you're done reading all those amazing issues. Same with your run on Wonder Woman. But you were super busy, and you came in on what was supposed to be eight page stories on darker image which was going to be an anthology series with rob liefeld and jim lee anybody who doesn't know about rob liefeld and his uh i don't even know what you would call it it's a deadly allergy to uh making deadlines or doing work um <laughs> or paying the people that he works with <laughs> but you were super busy doing all of this stuff that was very um mainstream it was very uh these huge characters i mean flash wonder woman these are enormous flagship characters and sam from what i understand kind of had to pester you into doing darker image was one of the reasons that you agreed to that the shorter page count and can you talk a little bit about what sam had to do to get you onto that series well, of course, he handed me this incredibly densely written book, written by some archaeologist slash philosopher slash uh, mind doctor that was all about, you know, primitive life and and so forth. And and so he sent that book along to me. And I got through some of it, but I was what well, part of it was that image at that point was being distributed by some really really bad distributors. Uh, and I, uh, my friends at Fantagraphics have been heavily screwed by that. And so, uh, I, I felt like I didn't really want to work with them anyway. So that was the first time I turned him down. And then he came back in a month and he said that he, he had found somebody else to write the book and he didn't like what that they'd written it. I said, well, but you know, I just been reading and I always believe the last thing I've read comic anthology books don't sell. So, you know, there's really no point to it. Plus, as you say, I would actually, during most of this period, most of the period that I was working, I was either writing four or five books a month. 
which kind of explains, you know, some of my erratic behavior. I had a cold for two years, just, you know, just from stress. Because there was not just, it was the, there was, there was Wonder Woman, there was Dr. Fate, there was uh, uh, the Batman newspaper strip, there was, uh, there were, there were, it wasn't always the same, the same books, but I mostly was writing four or five books a month and I was trying to write Journey. I was still trying to write Journey and some, and then draw a Journey. And, and I was doing, uh, then I was doing uh, Wastelands where I was writing and drawing. And, and do I remember exactly where all that fell out? But, you know, I was doing quite a few books and I was doing, and now Sam was coming in and begging me to do another one that was not going to sell because it was an anthology book and, and it was being distributed by criminals. Uh, and so, you know, I, I kept turning him down. And so I, I said all of this three times. And then he said, well, he'd heard that we were going to be getting a new distributor. How about it now, Bill? And so, uh, thinking, well, do I really want to hear about how I wouldn't work with him every week for the rest of my life? No, I don't want to hear that. So I said, sure. And of course, that completely changed my life. Uh, I was able to, we were able to move to a better part of the state where my wife hadn't been mugged. And, uh, and I was able to, you know, buy a house and and Sam was able to buy a house too, but he was able to buy a house in California. I was able to buy a house in Livingston County in Michigan, uh, which was still, still a nice house, but it just, uh, we eventually, uh, everything just sort of fell apart, you know, like three years later, four years later, maybe. Um, and so anyway, that was, that was how that, that part of it worked. Can you talk a little bit about how, and I know that this is very, this is a very loose term, uh, the writing on the Max. Um, Cause the, the, the only issue of Darker Image that ever came out is issue one. You, I know you guys finished issue two because, uh, and I didn't even know this until like a year ago when I finally coughed up the cash, but uh, it's in the Max Artists edition but the series had already been canned. It was already clear that Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld were not going to have stuff out on a tight enough deadline to, to make Darker Image work. And so the Max 1 actually beat its origin story in Darker Image to the stands by like two weeks. Um, was there a lot, was there a big conversation that happened from with you and Sam between going from Darker Image to the max or was that just kind of like uh, i'm already signed up for the ride i guess i'm going to go along sam was doing all the negotiating uh, largely with jim lee uh because each one of the the partners had a control over a certain number of the books i never did get to go into the image tent that was that was such a crazed thing i probably am, am just as well out of it just like drinking and smoking. Uh, but there was, there were like, the story goes that uh, one of the guys, Todd McFarlane, or this was when everything was so hot, they would, they would actually stand up on the tables where people were coming to get their books signed and they would throw books out. They were just on the verge of being published or just had been published. Uh, and people would be trying to catch them. And there were actually a couple of riots that took place in that image tent because they didn't have room for everybody that was coming to get their book signed. I was the guy that, that was just unpopular enough that, that uh, I could be in the book, in the uh, thing. But even so, the guys who were running the conventions would come to me and say, you know, you're blocking everybody's table. <laughs> and, you know, you sort of felt like saying, oh, I'm my mother's son, so I didn't. You're the one who's running the fucking convention. You're the one who makes makes all the where people are going to stand and 
and where they're going to run the lines. I know that the uh, the convention that we have here has like which I don't remember having before. So I think it might have been the influence of, at least partially of me, of having these uh, ribbons that guide people around in sort of an S curve. Because I know that, that at one point I was just sitting there and I'd never had this experience. I would, you know, I was, I was doing Journey that was, that was, was, was selling like 15,000 copies maybe or 20,000 copies. It was not... And even my my other DC books, I mean the the, the top level before Image was three hundred and fifty thousand copies, and that was what the X Men were selling. And people thought, thought that you could not sell more books than that. So when we sold uh, one point four million for the first issue of the Max, um, that was a lot of comic books. Um, my my favorite, but that gave me one of my favorite memories. Because what would ha- what happen is I would be sitting in this, you know, behind the table. I actually sat, got sat to sit behind, instead of just my table, which is what always used to happen, I would sit at the signing tables, you know, that were still warm from, like, like people from uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, people like that. And so I would be sitting there and I would be signing the thing and I would be saying... And, and Don Simpson and, and I and Bill Willingham, we all made a, you know, we all tried desperately to get people to buy books that they were going to read. Because we did, it, it felt bizarre. Because they said, are you buying these to collect or are you buying them to read? You should always buy at least one book to read. Because that's what you should be doing. You should be reading comic books. It never, never, it was a really hard sell. Uh, these kids would be showing up and they would be telling me that, you know, well, I'm, this is how I'm going to go to college. And uh, they would be like 12. When I was 12, I didn't even consider that I, you know, that I would be going to college. My father was considering it, but I wasn't considering it. Uh, so anyway, I was sitting there, but I, it was the first time I realized that there was a problem that I kept having to pee. And as soon as you sat up to go to the bathroom, stood up to go to the bathroom, everybody would go, uh, and I think it was John Ostrander at an adjoining table who said, Bill, you got to give them warning. You got to uh, pick somebody and, and let them be the last guy in line, you know, so if they're in line, then you can just, you know, be, and sometimes that was a little difficult because you couldn't really judge it the way you should, and your plumbing would betray you. But uh, anyway, uh, so I so I was looking for something, and so I so I'm desperately having to go to the bathroom, and there's still like this huge line. So I look for somebody who looks like they're mature enough to handle this, and I and he was like, you know, he was maybe 25 or something. Uh, as opposed to the eight-year-olds who wanted to kill me because I wanted to pee. And I said, well, I'm going to let you be the last guy in line. If you could do that, but I will sign your book as soon as I get back. And he, he said, sure. So that's how we worked it. And I, uh, and I went off to go to the bathroom. And then I came back, and he was there, and uh, loyally, loyally waiting. And uh, it always takes longer at these things than you think. And... And he said, well, actually, so, so what book do you want me to sign? And, and he said, uh, actually, I don't, I don't want you to sign a book. He said, I just came to see you. And he said, can I shake your hand because of uh, the Piper? So that's, that's always a nice, a nice memory. Do you want to take just five seconds? I think a lot of uh, younger viewers are probably not going to be super familiar of the significance of just name dropping that can you just talk a little bit about that character sure the 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 pied piper was an old was one of the rogues gallery for the flash and he was one of the characters when 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 wally became the flash that he sort of inherited from from barry because the original flash died in uh, crisis on infinite earth and uh, so his Teenage sidekick then became the Flash, and I was using that a lot. I was using that 
as 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 Wally uh, Wally West having sort of a crisis of, of feeling insecure because he wasn't really the man the Flash was, and so he was constantly running up against all of his old villains. Now, that was my motivation. The motivation of my editor was that. Stronger editors steal your villains from you if they're really good villains. And you have to keep using them and show that you're re, uh, uh, rethinking them. And so that was one of the reasons that The Flash always had... I never had to actually make up villains because uh, my, my editor was focused on my using old villains to try to keep people from stealing them away. Uh, Suicide Squad stole all our all our old villains. He would make a funny noise to the back of his throat whenever he thought about all all our villains being used by somebody else. But this particular the Pied Piper, I thought was a really interesting character because all these all these villains had like some problem. You know, like one of them was tone. Uh, he I think he was tone deaf, and then another one had. Uh, was colorblind, and there was another one that, and so because they were babied by their by their by their mothers and fathers, they uh, they then became supervillains. I'm not sure that that actually trained kids to, to not not be spoiled, but that was the motivation of the first generation of, of DC editors, anyway. So anyway, they I had reached a point. They they had a series both in Marvel and DC, really, really, really awful things about, about gay people. Uh, the, the Hulk was, it turns out, as a young man, raped in a bathroom, and that was what gave him his Hulk rage. And then they create, they had a whole bunch of, of characters, disparate characters, who had their, uh, their mutant powers uh, turned on and so they all became new heroes. And one of them was a character who was this incredibly, flamingly gay character called uh, Estrano, meaning the strange one. And, and, and he, so he became a superhero. And then and they came to the editor who, was, who had done all this. And they said, you know, well, he doesn't, he doesn't seem to be, you know, particularly gay anymore. He had a really, really strong lisping accent and a whole bunch of things. And and, he, and, the, here, and, the, and the editor said, oh, well, getting his powers cured him. Well, you can imagine how well that went over. And I actually volunteered a couple of times. People, you know, I would pass um, notes to the uh, editors at, when they were, we were at conventions together. I said, Estrano, I can, I can, I can find a way to make Estrano work. They, they, nobody believed that I was serious. Uh, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, like, half the editors in New York live together. It's too expensive as an as an editor, at, even at Marvel or DC, to be able to, to just have your own apartment. Famously, uh, Marv Wolfman and, and Len Lee were, were old friends who, who lived together, and it's a very common thing in New York share apartments it's not very common in new york in in uh, in detroit unless you actually are gay and so i i thought you know that's one of the reasons i think that nobody wants to even touch realistic portrayals of gay people but we were now on our like the fourth blow up over this and there were all these weird things like one of one of the speedsters in in uh was it one of John Burns things? They, they always said that he was supposed to be gay, and so there was all this all this back and forth about gayness in comics, and everybody was a little afraid to touch it, you know, in a way. So I had thought, you know, well, I should, you know, I have a book. I have an actual book in the Flash, which is an archetypal book, and everybody was doing it awfully. I mean, John Byrne actually created a sim relatively sympathetic gay character, and he did Superman as well. Uh, even though he seemed to think that people's actual head shapes changed 
when when you if you were gay. Uh, but still, but still, it was a it was a good it was a good uh, try. And uh, so I was thinking, you know, well, I could do something. I I which one of the characters that I have currently. I could introduce a new character, but it's sort of like the new character they, they created in Archie. It's, you know, well, it's the gay guy that just popped in to say, hi, hi, I'm gay. Uh, and that, you know, that really didn't work very well. So it really should be a character you already know, because that's what happens in real life. You don't, being gay is not the first thing you know about somebody. And so I was looking through all these characters and it should be somebody who's sympathetic. Uh, Mason Trollbridge was was really old and uh, had had been like a golden age sidekick for somebody else, but he was not a uh, you know he was not front and center enough somehow. And I well you know I, I've turned Chunk into a very sympathetic character, who would be at this point overweight, black. Uh, with a speech impediment, and then he'd be gay. Um, boy, that seems sort of rough on you know. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And I thought, well, what about you know? I've really turned I turned the Pied Piper into a kind of a Robin Hood character, and he's he. You know, I've had a lot of of good comments about him. He should be the guy. And so at the next uh, convention, I went to my editor, Brian Augustine, and Brian said, you know, I have, an, I have something I'd like you to ask you to do, Bill, because Wally lost all his money. So I want, the, I want him to be hired by the IRS, and he'll be having to fight these uh, four villains in this IRS storyline. And I said, well, I'd be glad to do it, Brian. I have a request, too. I'd like to turn the Pied Piper gay. And he sort of, he sort of took a breath uh, and, and uh, he said, like, like for a hero gay. And I said, yeah. And uh, I said, I know what I'm asking because I know what those uh, editorial things you have to go through on Wednesdays every day and they're all going to tease you. And they're all going to, uh, you know, you're, it's going to be, it's going to be, because uh, I'm not going to get any of the feedback. You're, you're the one who's going to get all the feedback. And, but I really want to do this. And I explained about all the failed gay characters that people had been doing. And I said, but, you know, I know, I know what's going to happen. And he says, yeah, well, fuck them. Let's do it. Good for him. Wow. Uh, he says, I'm kind of a liberal. <laughs> so there you go. And, uh, you know, well, this was the 80s. And being a liberal in New York is, is, is a little harder than being a liberal. You know, I just, I just have to wake up at morning in, in Detroit and I'm a liberal. But uh, Brian always had the, had the biggest balls of anybody. And uh, I gotta say that's a really that's really cool to hear. I didn't know how much pushback there 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 would be about because it was so cool to see Pied Piper show up, and that I think planted seeds where it wasn't the defining aspect of his character. It wasn't the first thing you found out. It wasn't the first care. You know, I really like that, and I think it played very heavily into where the industry has kind of moved into now where they can much more respectfully discuss and deal with a lot of that stuff. So super kudos to you, man. Uh, that you is super well handled and I always really enjoyed the character. So it's really cool to hear that you got such positive feedback from fans and stuff too. I wondered if there was people much crossover between an audience who was appreciating that level of, cause it, you, you approach it with the same level of intricacy that you approached when you were talking about reference work for journey earlier like it made me laugh because you're like well you know i knew when i drew a tree that it would be a tree that was here and i'm like man most guys who draw comics don't even care what planet that tree is from they're like let me just get a freaking tree on that page and we're good it's that kind of attention to detail and that thought process that i think that has made you stand out so much over my lifetime 
And speaking of this approach to everything, let's get back to the, the writing on the Max. It's going from darker image, you guys are picking up, you get oh, like, you got that yeah. first issue out, everything blew up. You sold millions of copies. From what I understand, it was kind of a back and forth on that, because you and Sam were living on separate parts of the uh, country at that part, at that point, yes, right? I was, I was, I was, I was in uh, Detroit and, uh, and, and Sam was in uh, LA. And so it was mostly just telephone conversations where you guys were hammering out what was happening. Can you talk a little bit about the plotting and writing process? You know me pretty well now. Yes, I can talk about it. Now, for one thing, the process actually got started before uh, Darker Image, before, because we had to figure out some way of actually doing this. And so what Sam would do is he would call me up, and this was true through the whole series. He would call me up and he would say, okay, so this is the story that we're going to tell. So he would go through the story that he had, he had made up. And then he said, you know, then we can, uh, you know, you have anything to add or what, what would you like to do with the story? But I never really had much to actually, aside from, aside from Sarah, you know, I, I, theoretically, since I was doing all this writing, I should be, I should be coming up with ideas for, but the Max was such an, uh, an odd character that I couldn't really think of anything that he should do, you know, like out of my head, uh, or out of his head. Uh, and also the fact that I, I, people ask me, so what is it? What is the Max exactly? Is he a rabbit? Is he a, you know, is, is he like, like Harvey, the, uh, from the old Jim, James Stewart movie? You know, that seems to be what you're saying. What are you exactly, uh, so, so, and how did he become this way? And, as if I didn't ask Sam that. As if I didn't ask Sam like that every day of my life. And Sam would say, well, I'm still working on some of that, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to make it uh, too, uh, you know, too on the nose. Uh, people should, you know, people should actually, you know, be able to find out about this gradually through the series. And I said, Sam, you know, there's a lot of things a creator can do. A creator can fool his publisher. A creator can fool his letterer. A creator can fool his colorist. The creator cannot fool his writer. I have to know the backstory of everything. Well, you would think saying that and making that stand, that that would have been the end of it. No, I fought every week to find out more things about the Max. Exactly what's supposed to be going on. I have no idea why there are jumping beans inside of that mask mask or that Max mask. I have no idea. It took me forever to, to find out that Sarah was Mr. Gaughan's daughter. It took me forever to, to find out that, uh, you know, I, everything, everything was about. And, but, you know, it was such, a, such an interesting thing. It was, so, it was so much fun. And now on the other hand, we had, uh, Sam made a, a bargain with, uh, what are the trading card? What's the trading card company? You're talking about Tops. Tops, yes. He made that bargain with Tops, and 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 he said, "Well, I'm what I did is I just cut out a whole bunch of of characters from the books, and uh, and then why don't you just write the backs about about the history of the Max?" And I said, "Well, Sam, you haven't told me anything about the history of the Max," and he said. Well, whatever you write, whatever you write will be the, uh, the history of the Manx. That was the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. 
is writing the backs of those tops cards. Or I could make up things about where all those Seuss characters came from and what they were doing and all of that, you know, that was just... That's really cool. I just was reading, uh, reading the backs of them two days ago. Like, so was that, was that kind of like a learning experience where you were kind of fleshing out the universe together and you got to kind of make some contributions with the top set? Yeah. Well, let's put it that way. That, that's a nice way to put it, that I was, <laughs> I, I made contributions. I wrote them all. I, Sam has no interest. Sam had no interest in, in, in going back and doing that. Uh, no, I, I just, all that, all that in the back there, uh, there are either things that Sam let slip or, or let himself be bullied into, or I just made it up. I just made up all the, uh, all those, uh, the, uh, the Krabbits and the Susadons. The, yeah. All, all that, that was all me. Uh, so, you know, that, you know, when people say you wrote the max, yes, I did it was the it was the actual story parts that that I really you know that, that Sam more or less wrote the plot to and then I would I would flesh out yeah I should actually say this out loud now having having done this so we would we would we would tell the story for this issue and then I would say okay Sam we've just told 40 pages worth of story we have to, uh, we now have to, why don't, why don't we uh, take, you know, 20 pages worth of that really good stuff and we'll put that in the next issue. And, uh, and so then he would sit down and he would do the, all the, he would do like, I think he would do the, the, the finished pencils. And when you're, when you're the inker as well, finished pencils are not as finished as they very often are. Uh, mine aren't anyway. And then he would uh, Xerox off really dark those those pencils. And then he would run over the parts that weren't dark enough with a magic marker. And then he would he would send those to me as faxes. We don't have any of those, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that would have been nice to save those, wouldn't it? Well... Yeah, I, I was ju I was just getting ready to be like, oh my god, you don't have any of those left, do you? That's such well, an interesting way. We haven't actually gotten all the way to the back of all the boxes and all the uh, bins. I found a whole bunch of uh, of journey uh, covers, comp covers, uh, you know, like last year. So conceivably, there could be stuff there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway. Uh, so that, that that comes back to me. Then I look at those and I uh, yeah, I do the, the the captions and the and the dialogue from those, and I do that in the computer, and so I send I send that as a fax usually, because I used to know how to do I used to know how to send faxes uh, from my computer, and that would be sent as as well as the finished artwork to our letterer who was also a sort of a final editor on this. He had been an editor. And so there was a lot of editing going on in a, in a certain way. But I think he discovered as well as I did that you can't really edit the Max because what is the Max about? No one knows what the Max is about. Uh, so anyway, that, so that was, that was the, the writing process to this. Uh, because the whole the whole idea of this was eventually Sam w was going to take over the writing. That had always been uh, once once he had learned enough about writing, because he was incredible. If you think he's insecure about art, he was really insecure about writing, and and he I think he thought it was kind of magic what I was doing. So we would send all that stuff in, and then it would all get combined into an issue of the Max, and then it would be sent off to the colorist who also lived in California. The other thing was all these other people live in California, as well as our, as well as the guy that did the, uh, the guys that were doing the cartoon of the Max. So that was how we wrote it. Yeah. I'm trying to track down Steve Olaf right now, man. The colors on that book always blew my mind. Him and, uh, 
Is it Ruben Rude? I think was uh, the other guy who was doing uh, backgrounds and colors and stuff. God. Uh, so it was. It was always kind of the plan when you came onto the series that that uh, you. Sam made a reference in one interview that I that I found where uh, he referred you as quote training wheels and like that basically on the tail end of the max uh, he he was wanting to fall flat on his face on his own merits I think was his was the way he put it so that was always kind of the plan was that uh, you come on and you're writing and he's kind of maybe paying attention to you and you guys are doing this more collaborative effort and he's learning how to write the series from you? Yes. In the same way that he learned in his mind, he learned how to ink from me by going over that issue of journey. Now, the fact that he's never really understood that he was actually instantly better at inking and doing my, my, my inking than I was. Now, in my defense, or whatever, I was not actually sure it would ever happen. Because, you know, Sam just was Sam. Was he ever going to be as good as... Uh... Yeah, I just had an insight, and I don't know if it's true or not. I, I pitched him the idea of... You know, if you're having all this trouble with the Max, what if we did like little three or four page short stories of Journey in the back of the Max? And it would, I would publicize me so that I would, because when this is all over with, you know, I was, I was, I was not making a lot of money off of Journey or off of Bliss Alley. And so, you know, we could get people used to the idea, and then we would be able to do that. Well, Max, of all the nice things that, that he's ever done for me, Sam just never really liked that idea at all. He, he would talk around it the way Sam does. He, he never really said no, but he certainly never said yes. And, and it occurs to me suddenly that he was afraid that if people actually saw my artwork and writing next to his, that they would not like his anymore. That sounds Which like was, a very Sam Keith conclusion to draw. It was, it was, and it was such a Sam Keith conclusion that it just occurred to me now. <laughs> because of course everybody was coming for Sam. Of course that was the reason they were there. But anyway... So the series is picking up steam. You guys are working on it and Sam makes the deal with tops. You guys have done the cards. That is a huge coup uh, for anybody uh, these days that doesn't know to have a series that came out because that top series came out almost concurrently with the first couple of issues. I mean, that, that, that series was out quick and you guys were getting a ton of exposure other places. I know that Sam was the one making all of the deals, and this is just operating from a basic level of assumption and suppositions that I have made because he just doesn't do interviews or talk. The cartoon. Or now, explain. I, Remember no, that he, he doesn't explain either. And, yeah, okay. And when he does explain stuff, read the same thing that he explains five years later when he talks in an interview about it, and it's totally different. But my, under, my basic understanding with the cartoon is Rob Liefeld had a, a system set up inside of Image that was yeah. for in-house development. Cross-promotion. Cross yes. And that Sam was basically able with very little exposure, understanding, experience, or effort was able to essentially sell the Max to MTV to get this cartoon series that resulted in one of the most absolutely magical moments in animation that I think has ever occurred. Was that, was that how it went down? Um, MTV was doing their best to play us against one another, which was probably mostly because, because they were kind of jerking us around. 
it turns out that what they really, MTV really wanted was Beavis and Butthead. And they wanted, uh, they wanted something else, too. But it wasn't... We thought that this was all... This was all going to lead somewhere. I think that was mostly what it was, was that we thought, you know, maybe they're going to ask us to write more cartoon series. You know, that kind of thing, that there would be legs to this. Because that was what I was always pushing us for, was to, because I knew that, you know, this was all eventually just going to fall apart. Uh, people, even, even, you know, uh, Don Simpson, and Bill Willingham, and and uh, John Ostring, all of these people knew that this could not last forever. This this huge boom. I know I was was sitting. Marvel had brought in a guy who was supposed to be this big promotion guy, and we were all before it was like a pre thing for the for the San Diego convention. So we were all in this auditorium, and this guy was talking, and he said, so how many of you, you know, were in comics five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, and we're putting up our hands, and eventually you know, just like four or five of us with our hands up. And I look around, and there's Don Simpson uh, with his hand up. And... And after a while, now that we'd re recognized each other, he walked around and sat next to me. And, uh, and this guy is saying, you know, well, I want to congratulate you because we're going through a, re uh, a recession now. I've forgotten whether this was the Reagan recession or some other recession. But anyway, there's some recession. And, and he said, and, and, but comics are just going on and going on. And so you guys have just created something that's never going to stop. It's never going to quit. And Don, in that Don voice of his, said, yeah, we repealed the law of gravity. Uh, because we knew that it wasn't going to last. And so we were all trying to do something, but you just, they're, they're, it was all very slippery, trying to create something new. And I don't, you know, because the thing is, well, what do you, where do you go with this? Do you, do you try to come up with your own uh, newspaper strip, for example? But we knew newspaper strips were dying. And, uh, you know, do you want to try to make a, a TV show? Well, which one of us had any contacts in the TV world? And if you, if you read about movies or TV... You know, that was even more cutthroat than comics was because they had the money to do it. And so nobody could quite figure out how to make this work. It, uh, so it was just, it was more of like a fortuitous thing that kind of happened, but you guys both, I know Sam tried to kind of move off from the, from the cartoon uh, into Hollywood after the uh, comic book was wrapped up. And that was one thing that I had never been able to put together quite where he had made that jump. But you're talking about, uh, you know, hoping things had legs and you guys both kind of having that general mindset of wanting to move forward with a relationship with somebody like MTV writing uh, for cartoons or series or whatever it might be. That explains a lot of stuff for me. So was I correct in the assumption that it was it was basically Rob Liefeld's in-house development that led to the show? Or was Sam actively seeking out people for that kind of thing? Um, since he had a lot of connections in the animation field, Sam desperately, desperately had always wanted to be a director, a movie director. And so that was where he went. Uh, when when the Max was over with, and even before the Max was over with, but he was creating this. He had this series about the the walking trout. That uh, I, you've obviously seen the walking trout. Yes. Uh, so so he was always doing things like that, as opposed to me, which was never doing things like that. I was I was always much more interested in the actual making the comic the comic book. 
I was going to say, and that's really interesting that you said he had connections because right until you said that, I, for whatever reason, I know Dave Feist is his cousin, but I've never put that together that Dave would have already been running around in those circles and have connections with the cartoon field. I'm sorry, little pieces are falling together here for me that I've spent a very well, long time. We're, we're both having here. Yeah. Did he ever talk about, uh, do, you, do you know who Dave Feist is? Did, did Sam ever speak of Dave with you? He's, I, he must have mentioned it. It, it, it sounds, he may have mentioned it just in the terms of them being cousins. You know. He's the guy who did the crap on in the hat. Uh, he designed them, and he's the guy who did uh, Mr. He did uh, Cow and Chicken, IR Baboon, and several other cartoons that were very prolific throughout the 90s. And I just, like, yeah. yes, that would absolutely make sense. Dave would have been running around with everybody. Yeah, that's because that's uh, my feeling is uh, all, the, all the stuff that we did. Because I was. Uh, I always hated the first issue of the Max. <laughs> and I was constantly pushing Sam. The one thing I was doing constantly pushing was the fact that we ought to be talking about, you know, there's so much weird stuff here, but we should have like one straight issue where he's a superhero. So we get to see why everybody thinks he's a superhero and why Julie thinks he's worthwhile having him sleep on her couch, you know. And so we ought to have at the end of the end of that, instead of him, you know, he saves this this rather smug uh, smug uh, woman from from being raped and murdered. And then at the very end, that Mr. Vaughn shows up and rapes and murders her. And I and I said, you know, I understand what you're saying. I understand that, that you really don't want this to be a traditional superhero, which it isn't. And it, it, it couldn't be, even if you tried for a thousand years to turn it into a traditional superhero. Uh, but, you know, I would like to have like one issue that just lets people get into it a little more. Now, I guess, you know, that was probably my bad because people were obviously really into it because we had the most popular book in the, in the, in the country or one of them, but I'm not sure that they were buying it, you know, because they understood it. They were buying it because they thought it was collectible and that that was not a reason for us to be doing it. So I was, I was constantly pushing, and so when they came to us and said, uh, can, you, can you write the first uh, two issues? Or, well, these are 15-minute episodes. So uh, could you write what's the equivalent of writing the first book? And I said, yes, I can do that. I can clean it up a little. And so that's the reason that it has a more coerce cohesive ending but also i was by, by the time i got done i was you know at that point i think i was writing the batman newspaper strip and still trying to finish journey and still doing all these other things and i'm thinking geez do i really want to keep rewriting the max for the for this cartoon series and and uh the guys called us up and said, well, you know, we really want to make this the most uh, accurate adaptation of a comic book into a cartoon that we can possibly do. And so that's what we're going to do. And so you don't have to keep writing it. I said, okay, good. But part of me liked the idea of writing it and part of it we didn't like the idea of writing it. Uh, because MTV is MTV and and essentially awful. They they said uh, that they uh, they wanted only one peop one person to own the Max. They didn't want us to be both having an interest in it. Well, I never felt like I really had an interest in it. I, I felt like Sam had come to me, and he was paying me out of his out of his cut, and he was paying me extraordinarily well. 
but Sam also had a really sharp, real sharp for a lawyer. And so I had to sign everything away completely for the Max. And so Sam and I came to this thing where he would own the Max utterly and completely. Of course, if it got reprinted, I was still going to get my my writing cut. But uh, and then and then I would get Ep Epicurus completely. So that's the reason that people keep fluttering around me, uh, even even now, wondering if I'd be interested in, in, in licensing out Epicurus. Interesting. I had never heard that. So, so with the creation of the Max, now I know you've said that Sam came to you with, uh, you know, with an idea and a lot of stuff. But I also know that the, the longer that I'm speaking with you, that it sounds to me like much more of the Max was a very, as I had always thought, a cohesive character that only exists with Sam's super far, way out there blah, 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 ideas. And you there with a, with a catcher's glove taking that stuff and being like, no, we can use these five lines, which are in between all the jazz scat that's happening. You know, he's throwing out all these random notes and you're the guy that's sitting there with the guitar playing the solo over the top of it. So do, do how much of the max, the character was, do you actually think was fleshed out when you came onto the series and following that, you, how much of the Max and his creation do you think you're responsible for? Uh, well, I was responsible for his voice. And I did my best to tighten up the relationship between, uh, between Julie and, uh, and the Max, since I didn't really understand to this day what, what the r relationship is between Julie and the and the Jungle Queen and and all of that. Most of that is is him. I didn't I didn't realize that Mr. Gone was a previous previously created hero of his who could jump between universes. Um, and and it was only about two thirds of the way through that I understood that Mr. Gone believes that he can jump into people's dreams and that, that he is still in a dream state and that anything that he does isn't real. He's just making it all up as he goes along. He doesn't really think of himself. He thinks that, I don't know if you've ever had this, I've only had it four or five times, where you can be in a dream and... Uh, and you think, well, I can, I'm in a dream now. I can do anything I want. And you can just, you, and so you jump and you can fly. And you can go and you can actually undress women in the street and they like it. And if, and if a policeman comes up and tries to make you stop undressing women, you can go with your finger and go bang and he dies. And so Mr. Gone thinks that being in our world is that. Even though... It's not true. It's not true. He's actually killing people. That's okay. the reason he can react and, and do horrible things and, and, and be turned into goo and, uh, and all of that. So I thought, oh, my God, Sam, it actually makes sense. It actually, some of, some of it, some of it now actually makes sense. And so I hope I said that out loud to you because... <laughs> It was it was a wonderful thing to realize that, and uh, he probably read a probably his mother clipped out a, a, an article about lucid dreaming for him, and, and uh, he he incorporated that. Now, other things like for example, uh, when he 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 was making uh, well he wasn't making much of a living. He was he was he was working for uh, Kamiko, I think. As a uh, uh, in their in their funny animal series, and that's where he created the is. Those 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 were his little funny animal characters. Except that he spelled it is, 
I am the one who created, who contributed the Z on the end, because it's always my feeling that you really, really shouldn't have any characters that are named after a, a vowel or a verb, because it's just going to come back and, and kick you in the ass. Uh, make writing way more difficult than it has to be needlessly. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So I created, created that, and I created... Uh, it seems to me like a lot of the first issue. I, I created the idea of her being a freelance social worker because I, I thought that was funny. But that's what she was doing. I mean, she was constantly bailing him out. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the central points of the entire series right there. And that's kind of what I'm getting back to, you know, with, with my question and, and signing stuff away. It's not so much to, you know, draw, like try to drum up animosity or be like, ah, oh, Sam should have never. But it really does kind of feel like maybe Sam's lawyer told him something. And now 30 years in retrospect, looking back, it's kind of one of those Stanley Jack Kirby situations where, yeah, Stan had a couple of really great lines that he spat out and then jack took it and actually pounded it as something that made sense well i think it's actually the other way around in that case i now no. when i was given the uh that that reward uh by uh by the uh, san diego convention for uh for being the an underestimated writer the other person who was made, given that reward was uh, Jack Kirby, and that was that was right. That was a good thing. He he did everything but actually right. But if you read the the things that 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 uh, Stan Lee contributed, it's it is irritating. It's irritating because Stan managed to. Uh, managed to be in management whereas Jack was always the freelancer and Jack always sort of wanted to be the freelancer but you know it was it was a it was a bunch of things and it was not people say that if you actually look at the artwork and the story that's being told and then you add, you go on that second level of the dialogue and the captions it's much better it's it's it, it 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 has a depth those comics have a depth to them with stan writing them that they didn't with just jack there no and i i would absolutely agree with that that it was kind of my point though is that soul creator and credit is is essentially given to lee at this point whereas I think that if you read anything that Kirby or Lee did separately, they're very much lacking. And you can see where the other picked up the slack. I, you know, that's, that's more of what I meant was that it was a much more, uh, like, uh, mutually symbiotic relationship between you and Sam, as far as the creation and the evolution of the max. I think that's true. But I also think I was, I was making enormous amounts of money and Sam and I only ever had a handshake and when he was when his his hands were so painfully constricted with uh, arthritis and I think he's found a way of he may have found a treatment for that now but he came back to uh, to write it to draw Epicurus uh when he didn't have to. So, you know, it's, it's, I do think that, that, that I certainly, I, I think I, I, I got the, uh, an even, even thing on it because also Sam was doing all this negotiating behind the scenes, things that I would never have been able to do. Yeah, and, and I'm not, uh, I, that might have come off as me trying to drum up or, or stick some, you know, stick a, a, something in between you guys, which it's not. I think that Sam is is very much like Neil Gaiman. And uh, when you talk about Sandman, one of the things that most people do not know is that Sam and Mike both have co-creator credits 
on Sandman to this day because Neil went to DC and was like, when he, when they, because they had originally given him Sandman and it was supposed to be a reworking of the original Jack Kirby character from the 70s. Right. Well, he just did his own thing. And when he came back, he was like, this is not Wesley, you know, this is not, this is not Wesley Dodds. This is not the original Sandman. This has nothing to do with it. I own the character or I walk. And Karen Berger was like, had enough forethought to be like, no, we'll give you the character. And after that, the first thing he did was follow that up with, and if I own the character, you give Sam Keith and Mike Dringenberg 10%. I, I was, I was bowled over when I found that out. And it sounds like that Sam really did go out of his way to really take care of you while the, while the series was going on and that kind of thing. And I do not want to underplay that or have anybody who's watching or listening to this think that I am trying to insinuate anything to the contrary, because that is always the feeling that I got. But it's really cool to hear that all you guys had was a basic handshake, because anybody who knows anything about the comic industry, movie industry, entertainment industry, period, knows how venomous and vitriolic those relationships can get when you put money into the equation. You've brought up Sam's hands twice now. Sam is an extremely personal guy. This is the first time in 15 years of reading about Sam that I've heard discussion of him having to actually dial back on his work because his hands were so bad. When did that start happening? I have no idea. I have no idea. He always claimed that he had problems with his hands because he, he couldn't ink properly the way I did. Really? And because I have, well, I grew up, don't forget, I grew up in an entirely different universe where, uh, or when we were learning how to, we were te being taught penmanship, you had to uh, hold the pencil so loosely that it could be drawn out of your hand. And, and so that's the way I ink. I ink pretty loosely as well. And Sam was always amazed at that. And he gets a death grip. On his on his brushes, and I haven't ever brought it up. Part of, I haven't brought up any of this stuff between Sam and me, partially because I was working for the Comics Journal, and I didn't want them to catch catch with a whiff of anything that was a pro problem. And there, you know, when I when I lost all my books, and then Sam decided that almost at the same moment that he was going to start writing for Max. But he was starting to write the Max because the Max had gone from selling uh, 1.2 million copies to selling 20,000 copies. And so it wouldn't have, you know, there wouldn't have been enough for me anyway, really. But I didn't, I didn't want to have one of those uh, Gary Groth interviews where we tear each other apart for Gary's amusement, even though I find those interviews very amusing when I'm not one of them. So... You know, that's uh, that actually <laughs> explains a lot as to as to why I've never heard uh, any of this really brought up or discussed. And I had not considered you working for the Comics Journal and having such intelligent forethought to kind of bite that in the butt. So now I I don't want to get too much into this. Um, are you aware of the lawsuit that happened on the MTV animated series? No. Okay. I think maybe somebody has picked this up and, and has mentioned it to me at the middle of a convention. But if you've ever seen me in the middle of a convention, I'm, I'm even more fractured than I am now. And the reason I've, I've never mentioned Sam's hands is I didn't want it to get back to people who might hire him. Yep. But I've seen now that he's, he's drawing just like Sam Keith in the little things that he did with uh, for DC. They're He's radically altered his style. Um, it's much less ink intensive, it appears now. The, mm -hmm. the old doodling, as he used to call it, the noodling and the doodling, with the, uh, you know, all the shreds and the tatters and all of that, that's evaporated. And in many of his interviews that I've gotten with him, he says, I can't draw like that anymore. And in 
myriad of different ways, but all meaning I cannot do it anymore. I had always previously taken that as Sam having some sort of mental aversion to doing it because he seems so upset about how much people like the Max. But with his hands messing up and the, the evolution in his style, that adds up a lot better. Now, as I said, the, the, the Max seems to be a double-edged sword for Sam. He loves and he hates the Max. What, as you guys were progressing on the series, was it getting easier or harder for Sam to work on the character? Because this the, the sales were falling, and I, I kind of always got the feeling that he felt a little bit freer to work on the series, but I was wondering if it was in, in actuality like that. Um, I think, I don't know, it might have been the case. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I always thought it was, it was great, by the way, that I got... I got replaced for one issue by Alan Moore. <laughs> you can't ask for much of a better fill-in writer, man. I know, I know. That was uh, that was so cool. Chris, I got replaced by by Alan Moore on on uh, on Mister Monster. Oh my gosh, you're right. Absolutely, man. I had totally forgotten about that. Talk yeah. about a small world, man. Yeah. So, um, you brought up. Sam uh, letting you go from the Max right around the same time that uh, you know your your stuff for DC was mostly wrapping up. I and know, the, and, and the stuff I was writing for uh, for Image too. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and I know that you've said Sam has treated you very well, and you obviously have an extremely high opinion and and feel that way. You know, was it hard to to walk away from from the max? There there had to have been pretty good money at some point, and even though sales were dwindling, and I'm sure that had to have been lessening. You know, did you did you know that there was such a dry spell coming? No, actually, it it all happened over the course of about three months. What yeah. happened with all of that? Because you you finished up your Flash and your Wonder Woman. And uh, I, Hawkman, I think, was another one that you were doing at that time, right? And, uh, and and as soon as you left the Max, it was within, like, maybe a few months, and it just seemed like DC was not having you anymore. You'd been there for a decade. You're assuming that, that there is uh, loyalty. N no, I'm not. I was just wondering if perhaps an editor had changed or, you know, several editors or... Well, one of the things that happened was that when you have editors, uh, see, there, there's, a, there's an illusion that people have that if you're working for, for, for DC or Marvel as an editor, that you're making a lot of money. And you're not making a lot of money. You're making very little money. And they're actually, so you would actually have editors who would have a lot of power over what the writer was writing, say, but they wouldn't have a lot of. They wouldn't. But the editor, but the uh, writer, and the artist would be actually making much more money than the editor who's controlling them. And so there was always a little something like that going on. And so four or five of the editors that I was using, mostly uh, uh, Brian Augustine, decided. Well, hell, I'm tired of being poor and getting to hire people who can make a lot of money. Why can't I make a lot of money? I know how to write this stuff, too. And he did. And so a lot, whole bunch of people, Paul Kupperberg and, uh, and Brian Augustine and uh, Mark Wade, all pretty much had left. And so as a result, the people that knew what I could do didn't, weren't there anymore. I think that's a lot of it. And uh, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, if somebody had left, and that's a changing a guard would make a lot of sense. And so you're saying, like, basically every editor you'd worked with had basically made the crossover into writing. And I was, you know, and plus, I didn't notice it as well because I, you know, I had made pretty good money there for quite a while. I was not only with the Max, but also with things like Night Witch and, and or whatever that witch was that I wrote. Uh, and, but, but a bunch of things way, way over, you know, you're, you're, you're getting money 
from Rob Liefeld and, and, and you're such an expensive uh, guy, you know, I'm suddenly making six or seven times as much money as my DC rate working for them. So, you know, I had, I had a fair amount of money and I was exhausted. As I said, you know, I had been, I, I, I had a cold for two and a half years and, and I, you know, and that all the previous times I had two or three foul periods and you just, you go down you clean out the basement, you, uh, you do a bunch of things and, uh, maybe do some, you know, some other kinds of drawing or writing, and, and then they'll come back and, and find you again. And that was part of the way I got into problems with people. Like I was assuming I was, I was borrowing money from my friends because I just knew that it was, uh, that it was going to, uh, that, that, that it was going to, this, this fallow period would end. But it never ended. Can you talk a little bit about, I don't want to dwell too much um, because I don't want it to uh, seem like a pity party, but uh, you have had some really rough times um, since, since leaving the Max. And as a fan of the Max, I wish I would have been, uh, now that the internet's around, it's amazing and I can hear about it and I can see about it and I can tell people about it. Uh, but I really wish I had been aware um, that you had been struggling because I, you know, would have made a very concerted effort to try to make stuff better for you, to make a voice heard for your return in the past. Um, can you tell can you tell our viewers just a little bit about what's going on where you're at now? Because I've had several people ask about how you were doing and what you were up to. Well, right now I'm working for a uh, comic, comic company called Resurgence, and they're they're working on being crowdfunded. So right now I'm sort of the story editor there, but I'm not making any money from them. For fun, I work at Yeet, and uh, that's that's more fun than anything because I, I would say that Brian Augustine and, and, and Diana Schutz. Were, were my best editors, but actually Mike, Mike Jones is my best editor because I will just come up with something and, and say, well, I'm going to have talking snowflakes in this. And uh, you know, I'll say, okay. So I make all my money off of doing doing commissions, which is how, how most people, most comic book people actually sweeten their incomes is, is through commissions. And uh, my problem lately has been that I was in an automobile accident, and not a not a terrible automobile accident, but it it made my sciatica worse, and it made my thumb and my little finger worse, and it's 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 been really hard to to keep up with the with the artwork that I did. I'm 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 planning on I on uh, probably coming down here to the studio. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you about, uh, you know, commissions and that kind of stuff? Because I'm terrible about remembering how much, what my prices are and everything. Uh, Mike Jones is the best way to reach out and, and get a hold of me. I have one or two people that I've actually found on my own, but, but for the most part, uh, it's easier. It's also easier. I, my, my, my rates and my, my, uh, my income for going to conventions actually increased considerably when Mike was there to, to tap me on the ankle and say, uh, no, Bill, your real price is $100 a page. No, Bill, remember we decided it was going to be $150 a page? Remember that? That's, uh, you know, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really hard to set your own prices. It's, it's, because you yeah. have somebody there, and they, they look like a spaniel, and they, oh, I've loved your stuff, and I drove in from the Grand Rapids. And I, and I bet you, you get make, that all the time. make yourself say, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, my, I'm, I'm, I have a, a rate of, uh, of $10, a, $10 a signature, you know. So I have got about 15 or 20 minutes left here looking at my phone. Um trying to think uh the the to kind of follow up now after you left the max um 
you and Sam, did you guys stay in touch? I know you did the Epicurus, uh, he, you said he did the Epicurus piece for you, just basically, you know, to try to help you out a little bit. And that would have been around 2002, 2003, right? Have yeah. you guys stayed in contact since then, or have you lost contact with him like every other person on the planet? The second one. In fact, I had lost contact with him when he was when, it, when he called me up and said he was going to do the Epicurus that, that DC wanted. It was that far back, uh, and I just I tried several times. I've tried all all the tricks that everybody else has tried, and go on his web page. Make a little mewing noise, and look like a spaniel, but it just uh, it just doesn't uh, just doesn't work. So I'm, you know, people ought to have control over their own privacy. I, Sam seems very private, and a lot of people are always asking me, you know, with these interviews, they're like, why don't you interview Sam Keith, dude? You've done like four hours of, you know, four hours of video about him, and you've interviewed his best friends from high school and his publishers, and I'm like, number one, Sam does not talk to people. He just doesn't. I've got like 15 interviews over the last 30 years of his freaking career, and most of those are like a page and a half, two pages, guys. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. And like, on top of that, like, I really do worry that like Sam Keith is going to see one of my pieces one day and get upset because I'm talking about something that I should, that in, that I shouldn't be talking about. And it's something that I constantly worry about and it does weigh on me a little bit, prying into somebody's life and asking these questions about his wife and his mother and this kind of thing. And it's only because I love him. If you're watching this, Sam, it's only because I love you, bud. Um, but it's, it kind of breaks my heart because it feels like every single person that he's worked with, every single one of his friends, he's either just kind of stopped returning phone calls or they just have fallen out of touch. And Sam will make no... He's got either got so much guard in front of him that he's unaware or he's unwilling to make that reconnection effort. Was that something that Sam dealt with when he was younger? Or is that something that you saw progressing as he got older? Because it's something that I saw happen after Sandman issue one, more and more and more to the point now where I, I don't know, but one person that I've talked to that's had contact with him in the last 10 years. You know, looking back on it, He's always called me. Now, he called me every week. <laughs> so I didn't really think about it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was fun. I mean, we had lovely, long conversations. And, and uh, in fact, he sent me uh, recordings of the, the Beatles' uh, White Album. He was into, uh, you know, sort of soft rock. And, and, I, and I was into uh, folk music. And so we would trade back and forth. I remember he, he, he asked me, uh, yeah, at this point, this was a long time ago, of course, but uh, he said, you know, what do you like? Do you like uh, iced tea and, 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 and that kind of stuff? And I said, well, not really. I don't really even understand it. <laughs> I, I was just listening to Puff the Magic Dragon the other day. I don't really... I, I don't really understand uh, Puff Daddy. Uh, <laughs> and he said, ah, so that's, that's, I, I always wondered when it would be that you would, you know, your age would start to show. What? There's, there's lots of hip young cats like me that, uh, but anyway, so we're going to have, have really long conversations. So I guess I didn't really notice that that that, I, that he was always the one that was making the call. Because um, I'm actually kind of quiet too. I eh? I've sort of gotten used to this 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 process now. And you know, it's like the other day I uh, I had gotten I I have a, I have a brace to try to not have my my sciatica in my knee hurt so much and. 
and so I, I went to, where do you live, by the way? What, what state? Illinois. Oh, see, I think you have Myers there, right? The, mm -hmm. the store? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, so I, 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 I had my cane, I had my brace on, and I was, I was thinking, yeah, I've just about gotten over this, all these problems that I'm having with my, with problems with my feet and problems with my hands and, and all that. And, and I, I went through the, the uh, electric door at Myers and I got too close to the gizmo that they have that, that, that you can, uh, that holds your, uh, your disinfectants to be able to go in. And so I was, I was a little off balance and I, I, oh, I'll just steady myself on this gizmo. And it was not anywhere near as stable as I thought it was. And so me and the cane and my whole weight and the, and the gizmo all came down on my thumb. So I, but I got up and people all gathered around and oh my goodness, oh look, he only has one arm. Oh my goodness, I hope that's all right. Oh, gee, is he? Uh, what what year is it? What year is it? Who is the president? Thank God it's not Trump. Uh, <laughs> and so and so they were there. They helped me up and. And the managers all came over. Do we need me? Do you need me to send uh, send for an ambulance? All of that. Uh, how many fingers am I holding up? Count backwards from four. All that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, no, no. Please, please don't send an for an ambulance. I can't afford an ambulance <laughs> on top of everything else, you know. But it, and it's embarrassing because all these all these very young women are are trying to hold me up and, and all that. But, you know, after that, I was able to, you know, I actually, uh, I had been looking around trying to find the, because uh, my, my, my foot hurts. So I was, I was looking around for one of those electric carts that you have. And I looked in the wrong direction and threw my balance off. And so I got back in my electric cart and I went off and I bought the water that I wanted to buy. And, so that part was all right, but then I get home, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, so what kind of pain is this that I actually have in my thumb? Is this that that sharp blinding pain that could mean that I, uh, I have a broken thumb? Or is it just uh, a sprain kind of feeling? And so I, I was not feeling too cool by the time I got home. I, I bounced off a couple of other things, you know, on the way down. Um, and I felt like being, you know, having people feel sorry for me, you know, for a change. You know, I just, I just felt like, like it was nice to, to have people care whether you live or die. And so I went on Facebook and I told this story. And I'm getting like 60, 70 people writing and saying, oh, you know, try liniment. What is your, you know, how are you doing? If you have a problem, my, my, my cousins are calling and, and, and say, you know, do you need us to come over and do your shopping for you? And it's, it's, you know, it just, it just makes you feel good. Uh, so that's, that's me. I use, I use Facebook for, for pain reduction more than anything. Uh, plus, you know, then the, like three days later, I, I looked out at my hand and I apparently had fallen on the entire hand. And uh, it was all all sort of light green. I, I so I wrote about that, and I said, you know, either I either I, I fell on a Meyer sign, or I uh, or I've been exposed to gamma radiation, and I'm really <laughs> angry. And then I, I said, you know, and my thumb is now green and mauve and and. Uh, and black and, and and streaks of blue and I said I've always wanted to have a thumb that was the same uh, color scheme as a uh, as a swamp thing cover. So <laughs> it's 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 actually a lot of fun to have Facebook. I I think I don't I don't seem to get into 
all the flame wars and, and stuff that other people do. You're not a, you're not enough of a negative person. If pe the people that get in that kind of stuff are either sucked into stuff too easily or just triggered by su by stupid simple trolls. And like that's been the one of the biggest pleasures of of finding you is just to discover like how really you seem like just a like a duck with water rolling off his back, man. Just take everything in stride. And it is such a pleasure to speak to somebody who's as upbeat and intelligent and you you seem to always be able to look on the brighter side of things, even when you need to, you know, even when there's a lot of crap going on, you try to stay positive. And I think that's, there's a lot to be said for that, which people you get on Facebook, just read their walls and what they post about themselves. You get, you, you find out really fast why they get into those fights because mm -hmm. they're just looking for an excuse to fight. They want to fight somebody. Well, and if, you know, I've been in comics fandom for a long time and, I've had my, my share of having to pull people apart as they're wrestle, wrestling on the ground, the stand guys and the jack guys and, and all of that. And, you know, the weird thing is, I mean, you were saying that, 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 uh, that Stan gets all the credit, but I really think that, that uh, Jack, uh, everybody, everybody likes Jack and they, and they all, you know, and, and they all blame stand for everything and you know and people say oh man you interviewed stan lee once boy you bet you had to be really careful and no i brought up all the things that people were saying about it because that's people what people love you know they they want they they, they it shows that you are paying attention and yeah no i i think totally inside of the industry you're absolutely correct anybody who's been a comic reader for 20 15 20 years anybody who fancies themselves a comics historian yeah they they love jack kirby and usually those guys are all in what i call camp kirby and they are incapable of admitting that it was a relationship that happened that caused magic between jack kirby and stan lee and i don't care if Jack did 80% of the heavy lifting or 70% of the heavy lifting or 20% of the heavy lifting, it was about a cohesive, coherent relationship that happened, the chemistry that happened between them. You read what they did apart, you read what they did together, and it should speak for themselves. It's like reading the Max before and after you left. It should speak for itself, your contributions to the series. I mean, I don't see anybody should get soul creator. And you've been working in comics long enough. I'm sure you understand that better than anybody. You know how much that back and forth goes back. Is it the guy who comes up with the one line, the idea, the original G C germinating that turns into this other thing? Is it the guy who draws it and makes a, a physical representation in a medium that demands that, that, that deserves more credit? I don't know. It's not for me to say. Well, you know, it's a, uh, you know, another, another, I mean, this is, you know, this is really inside baseball, but uh, Journey is, is considered by people, and including me, to be mostly my, my creation. And I think it was. I, it was something that I was really, I, I, I was not exactly welcoming to have other people contribute to it, which was... It's sometimes been in my disfavor uh, for one reason or another. And my, my poor wife got a little of that. She, she would make suggestions and I, uh, I, was, not, I was not completely welcoming <laughs> to collaborating with my wife. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, the three greatest things that, I, that had happened in Journey were suggestions of hers. She went through and made all kinds of little circles in the trees so that the leaves looked more like leaves. She found a, a thing in the newspaper about how if you, uh, if, if uh, milkweed, if, if your cows ate milkweed, it would make your their milk poison. Not enough to make uh, adults uh, be poisoned, but it would be enough to kill calves or kill little kids who drank the milk. And that was the plot of Journey Number Two, and the Widow. And in fact, I put one of our fights in in that as well. 
or, or McAllister is, uh, is, is planting a garden for the widow. Uh, and then at the very end, she, she asked me if I was, uh, she said, you know, how are you going to end Journey? You know, you're, you're slowing down, you've slowed down so much. And I said, well, you know, I have all these ideas about, about uh, these sort of complex ideas and I can't get, get rid of them now because I'm two thirds of the way through the story. And I have to solve the mystery and so forth because uh, I have Edgar Allan Poe on one side and, uh, and uh, Raymond Chandler on the other side. And it's all a very complicated thing. And she said, but McAllister wouldn't understand complication. He would just leave. And so I was really mad about that for about a day and a half. And then I thought about it and I said, yeah, he'd just leave. He wouldn't care about the mystery. And so that was, uh, that was the last issue of Journey. And that's one of my proudest creations was that. And that certainly I, that idea came from my wife. So, you know, we did collaborate on and off uh, in between my screaming and pounding the wall. <laughs> well, that was my alarm. I literally have to go pick my daughter up from school. <laughs> it has been an absolute a blast speaking to you. I really hate to dash, but I seriously, I actually have to literally walk out the door. So I thank you so much, sincerely, from the bottom sure. of my heart. I cannot tell you what it means that you took four hours out of your freaking life to humor my silly questions. It has been absolutely incredible talking to you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with my viewers before I take off? Mike is laughing hysterically off off panel because he's he knows how much I love talking. I love it. <laughs> but no, I just I just hope that I haven't said anything about about Sam Keith that, that he feels bad about. That that's my And that and first, it's almost impossible to check with him. So I, And that's what I would tell Sam. Like I swear I'm not grilling all of your friends and like dredging up your history to be a bad guy. If you want me to stop, all you have to do is just call me or email me or hit me <laughs> up any way. I'll stop. You just have to tell me. Just one word from you and I promise I'll stop, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bill. Well, I'm going to dash, man. It's been yes. an absolute pleasure talking to you, brother.